Greetings, space travelers. Welcome home. You just tuned your dial to Space Style Radio, the only place where you can own the night. I am your host, Mr. Rob G. And tonight we're broadcasting to you on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, KPNL, and Odyssey Radio. Remember, you can access our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash Space Style Radio. And while you're there, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Spaced Out Radio and at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where the options are endless. You can stay up to date with the SWAR Newswire, get some official Spaced Out swag, plus rock out to some Bumblefoot and oh so much more. Want to thank you guys for coming on in tonight. Tonight is... Uh, what we call an SOR archive night. So we've jumped in the vault. We've dipped in and pulled out one of the uh, excellent videos, one of the many excellent videos that we have in the SOR archives. And we wanted to go ahead and share that with you tonight uh, as tonight or today rather is a holiday for some people in the United States and abroad. Um, For some people, it's just a Sunday. So just happy Sunday, happy day, uh, however you want to look at this day today, however you celebrate this day, however you soak this day in. I uh, want to thank you guys for coming on in. As I have taken the night off tonight, this is a pre-record. Um, and we're going to go ahead and definitely get you guys into some good stuff, though. Chat is still open tonight, live chat. So make sure you guys are in there chiming it up with each other. Uh, it's a wonderful atmosphere in our Spaced Out Radio chat. And I would love to read these things as I am enjoying myself on the holiday. So I might hop in the chat tonight uh, once or twice. Who knows? Um, but yeah, without any further delay, what we want to do is, and actually, let me just say this, uh, we will be back live tomorrow, which is Monday as we kick the week off. Uh, Dave Scott has Max Hawthorne coming in tomorrow. So that'll be a live show. Then I'll be back, um, next weekend with, uh, Susan Hill on Saturday and then, um, Dirty Filth on Sunday. How could I forget that? The Dirty One on Sunday. So it should be an excellent show. I can't wait. Um, But without further delay, I'm going to go ahead and get you guys into the edited archive show. So um, you'll notice some differences from the original broadcast. Uh, But let's go ahead and get that going. Until then, you guys have a great show. I may see you in the chat. But outside of that, Let's go ahead and get it in. Hey everyone, guess what? We do not have ugly swag. We have spaced out radio gear that you're going to want to wear. Why? Because no one wants to wear ugly clothing. 
So head on over to spacedoutradio.com and go shopping today. You'll be glad you did. And it's a great way to support our show. Once you get your gear, send us a picture of you rocking out in your SOR swag. Spacedoutradio.com. Shop there today and make yourself look good. If you love your woo, it's time to make a commitment to the third annual SOR Fan Party. This time, we're heading to Reno, Nevada and the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Tickets are $60 or $100 for VIP. With that, you get a free radio show. You get to hang out with celebrity guests from Spaced Out Radio, including our team, who are coming to hang out with you. You get to meet the entire team, like Science Bob, Merle, Melinda Leslie, Geraldina Roscoe, and more. It's a weekend packed with adventure, and we want you there. After all, we're doing this for you. Find out more and get your tickets at info at spacedoutradio.com and book your hotels today at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort in Reno, Nevada. Come join us for the SOR Fan Party, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Good evening for another great show on Spaced Out Radio tonight as we look into the other side of UFOs. How much is real? How much is not? Skeptic, writer, author, researcher Mick West is with us tonight. We are in for a power show of knowledge tonight. Before we bring Mick in, let us say hello to each and every one of you in our chat room so far. We got race fan in the gold medal position. Michael Morris taking home. The silver with Dino Bravo in the bronze medal tonight. Hi, Roy Boy and Laura Lobbs. Brown Dwarf, how you doing? Little Timmy Senor, nice to see you. Cable Guy, how you doing? Cable Guy will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Monica and Les Paul Holland in Australia, good to see you. Hi, Max Ritchie. Michelle L., how are you? And uh, Susie B., thank you for coming on in. Hi, Paramarv. Thank you for joining us as we continue on with our roll call tonight. Pixie Lara, sh Sensational Sherry, good to see you both. And uh, let's scroll on down. And who do we have next? Millennium, my man. Robert Lamoth, good to see you both. Steve Edmond, thank you for coming on in. And Jessica, S it's always good to have Jessica here. Uh, Kurt M., thank you for coming on in. Tim Othman, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And Gizmo, thank you for joining us from beautiful Abbotsford, British Columbia. Yeah, my hometown. All right, continuing on, Mark Sanchez, Raymond L., Lee the B., thank you for joining us. Digger Dog, Vaughn Patrick, good to see you both. Uh, underscore Maddie, thanks for joining us. Hope your hair is looking fantastic tonight. The lovely and talented Kira, thank you for coming on in. Hi, Christine Lynn. Uh, Jerry, a JSCO, how you doing, man? And uh, continuing on with our roll call, Bash the Impaler. Good to have you back. Forrest Louie, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. The Super Chat 
is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so, so much. Nikki from Seattle is here. Nikki will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Bobby Farron, good to see you. Roger Murray, how you doing, buddy? And uh, there's Susan out of the way and Warden Dragon. Sweet Tony D from the UK in Wales. Thank you for waking up early for us. Deb from SAC. Andrew B., thank you for coming on in as we continue on with our roll call tonight. And Richard Elmore, good to see you back. TMI, thanks for coming on in. And Deal You Whoopoo, welcome back. Bill H., Voices, how you doing? Good to see you. Hi, Javier at Cryptid559. Always a pleasure, my man. And uh, who? Aaron Baca, good to see you. Aaron, preferred, I guess. All right, let's see who's on Facebook tonight. Uh, let me just get this going. I just got to refresh this. And who's uh, chatting away on Facebook right now? Uh, we have Sparkles and Mitchell Kurt Manning. Hello. As uh, you know, what we're going to start the radio side. There we go. And that way, Bill WD40 could get into the chat room and lube us up for tonight's show. Corruption Czar, how you doing, man? Good to have you here again, uh, Chedwin Mendoli. What's happening? Welsh Hammer, good to see you. And, uh, yeah, we're going to have a big group tonight. I can already feel it. It's going to be a good show. Good, good show. One of those good ones that uh, we like to have here every now and again. Yeah, we like a good show every now and again. Deb, thank you so much for the super chat. Very much appreciate your love and support nightly on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you, Deb. And, uh, yeah, we got about 35 seconds. If you haven't already, head on over to our store on our website, spacedoutradio.com. We got great swag there for you. We really do. And, of course, if you haven't or you're new here, do us a favor. Give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. Leave a comment after the show. It helps with the algorithms as well. Follow us on uh, our social media. Like, hit subscribe. Ring that bell. We're here seven days a week for your listing entertainment. Mama Catherine, mwah, we love you. This is going to be a good show for you, my dear. Good to see you. And, uh, yeah, we're like five seconds away. So do us all the favor, people. Get your horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talkstream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a great show for you tonight as Mick West is here to talk about UFOs, UAPs, and what's the truth behind all of this talk going on all across the world. Then in hour number three, we got a great story from Among the Missing with Steve Stockton. Then Javier from Cryptid 559 joins us for tonight's Cryptid Reports. Mick West is the author of Escaping the Rabbit Hole, How to Debunk Conspiracy Theories Using Facts, Logic, and Respect. He's also the host of the podcast Tales from the Rabbit Hole. Both focus on developing tools for understanding and helping people who've been sucked into conspiracy theories. Mick is a retired video game programmer who helped make the highly successful Tony Hawk's Pro Skater franchise. He also runs a website called metabunk.org, where he investigates conspiracy theories, debunks pseudoscience, and analyzes UFO videos. 
And tonight, we're glad to have Mick back on Spaced Out Radio for the second time. Mick, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. How you been, my friend? I've been doing good. Very glad to be here again, Dave. It's always good to have you here as well, because you bring a totally different light than what we do on a nightly basis. And, and you know, like I was saying to you uh, previously on the air, you know, belief-wise, our, our attitudes may clash, but in the end, it's about trying to find facts. I'm trying to find it from the woo side. You're trying to find it from the 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 relatively human human side of things. You know, I mean, do you enjoy what you do? Do you enjoy being a part of this community and what you can contribute? I do. I, I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I've actually made quite a few good friends in the community uh, over the years. Uh, and what I do, I think, is perhaps misunderstood i think a lot of people look at like me and think like there's mick west the debunker he's the guy who's trying to prove that aliens are not real when really like i would like nothing better than to prove that aliens are real and that ufos actually contain aliens and that ufos are some kind of advanced technology that would be like pretty amazing i'd really love to discover that but what really got my interest in this whole subject was really just the simple excuse me analyzing ufo videos and that was something that, you know, because of my previous experience, like looking into the chemtrails conspiracy theory and my experience, like learning to fly and my like, you know, 3D coding skills, uh, I just got to be fairly good at and I just enjoyed doing it. And I enjoyed trying to figure things out. And of course, along the way, I experience all kinds of things like talking to different people with different opinions. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's a lot of fun <laughs> just just interacting with people i actually went to alien con uh, a few months ago in, in pasadena and i had a great time there talking to a whole bunch of different people and uh, i really enjoy the community and i enjoy the act of trying to figure out what's going on so for you being or having this enjoyment of it i mean you you sit here and and yet there's a lot of people online who will put a lot of words in your mouth you know as they do with anybody out there who is famous pseudo famous or has an opinion that's highly differing than yours i mean for you would you consider yourself a believer in ufos and ufology or would you consider a, yourself more of a of a person who you need to see it to believe it well i guess a, a bit of both really uh i think you know, UFOs obviously are, are a real thing in that we see things in the sky that we can't identify uh but then people put different interpretations on the evidence and what it actually means and how significant it is. And uh, of course, the big thing, I think, the big difference between me and a lot of other people is, I guess it's more of a perceived difference rather than a real difference, is, is the, the issue of like eyewitness testimony versus hard evidence. So hard evidence will be something like a video or a, some kind of data recording, something like that, so, you know, radar or something like that. Whereas eyewitness uh, evidence is is like a not hard evidence as such. You know, it's still evidence, but it's not hard evidence. I tend to look at things that are mostly on the kind of the hard evidence side, like things like videos. Uh, and I have a lot of difficulty kind of like getting to grips with the eyewitness stuff. Uh, and that I think gives people the impression the I'm dismissing this eyewitness testimony when, uh, you know, I'm really not, you know, you, you factor that in as well, but unfortunately eyewitness testimony is unreliable. Uh, and I know that's like a hard thing to, to hear for people who have had their own personal experience, but when you're trying to figure out what happened in a particular case, you can do a lot better with, with the hard evidence, the videos and things like that than you can do with eyewitness testimony. Going down the road of eyewitness testimony, you're going to end up with like, it's, it's like, you know, the, this person experienced something, but we can't really resolve what it actually is. If you have a video, then you actually have a pretty good chance of resolving what the thing actually is. So I tend to focus on that aspect of it. And I think that gives people the idea that I'm ignoring the eyewitnesses when I'm really not. I actually really enjoy talking to eyewitnesses. I've actually interviewed quite a few eyewitnesses and uh, I think it's a, an important part of the overall uh, phenomena. How did you get into all of this? What made you take on the UFO field? Because, I mean, for someone like you, I mean, I look at you 
as a lone wolf in this field. Yes, there's other skeptics, you know, and everybody kind of has their own way. I don't look at you the same way I would look at Stephen Greenstreet or or yeah. John Greenwald or, or somebody of that ilk, you know. So for you, how did you become this lone wolf of ufology? Well, I, I think everyone kind of works to their skills. You know, John Greenwald's skills are in uh, doing FOIA requests and being dogged in uh, following up those those requests and figuring stuff out and and documenting things and storing all these documents and then trying to interpret interpret what these documents mean. Uh, Stephen Greenstreet is is a journalist, so he he does you know stories. He, he formulates stories based on the information that's out there, and you know some of them are entertaining stuff like his video series, but also informative, like because he is a journalist, but you know also a bit of sensationalist as well, because you need to do sensationalist stuff to get people's attention. Yeah, my strengths are really in like I guess two areas. I would say one is uh, analyzing things on a technical level. And then the other is explaining those things. So I make these explainer videos that try to explain what's going on. And then I'll identify something in a video and then try to demonstrate what's actually happening. Like today, someone posted a video of a, uh, a meteorite, you know, kind of streaking across the sky. And it looks like the meteorite kind of slows down and stops and then kind of hovers in a spot for a while and then kind of moves backwards a bit and then moves forward. And you know, I recognized this as something I'd seen before, which is this, this thing called the uh, stabilized parallax effect, where if you move your camera around, it looks like things in the distance move because the camera automatically stabilizes the foreground. It's kind of this new thing in, in ufology. And so I made little videos trying to explain that. And I, I've been thinking today about how I can explain that. So really, it's, you know, people use their own unique set of skills and i think i perhaps just i'm very lucky in that i have a very specific set of skills that perhaps doesn't exist out there in the ufo investigation uh, scene especially on the more skeptical side of things so I, you know, i'm a, a retired video game program i was lucky enough to kind of retire fairly young and yeah i still have all this this skill in you know doing 3d math and uh you know in, uh, figuring stuff out and programming visualizations and, and explaining things to people. And uh, I just fell into this niche. And there was just, there's no one else there who's really doing it exactly like that. You know, there's lots of others investigating out there, but you know, lots of people, they got <laughs> real jobs to do as well. Uh, whereas I'm, I'm retired, so I, I've got lots of spare time and I also have the skills. So I'm just kind of fell into this and I enjoy doing it. So I like doing it. I, I'm going to keep doing it. What do you think about the online harassment that you take? Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying that people can't disagree with you or disagree with me or anybody like that. But it seems like especially UFO Twitter, which I, I, I truly I'll say what I call it. I call it a cesspool of of horrid, horrid information and, and, and word uses of the English language at times, you know, but. You know, for you, I mean, you're constantly attacked. You are constantly berated. People call you a lot of horrific things. You know, I mean, how do you put up with that? Where, where do you find the internal strength on that? Well, um, I think perhaps other people see that more than I do because whenever somebody starts up something like that, what I tend to do is, you know, I'll engage with them if they seem like they want a conversation. But if they don't, if they're just slinging mud, then there's no point slinging mud back at them because everyone's going to get dirty that way. So I just mute them. Uh, I don't I don't block people usually. I usually just mute them so I just don't see what they're seeing. And so I've got a, a mute list that probably has like a few hundred people on it because over the years, uh, lots of people have, have uh, been, uh, I guess, mean tweeting to me. And you know, I just there's there's plenty of other people who want to have good conversations and so I prefer to spend my time with the people who want to actually you know, interact in a productive and meaningful way. And I, I, so I end up not seeing a lot of the attacks, which perhaps other people actually see this because you know, they haven't muted these people. So it, it doesn't bother me that much because I don't see that much of it. And when it does happen, you know, I think you've got to have empathy. Like, I think my default position is that you know, this person who is being mean to me is being mean to me because 
they don't understand me, which in part is my fault. You know, I haven't really communicated my position effectively. And some, sometimes I come across um, badly on Twitter, like, you know, I will say something that's a bit abrupt. And my, you know, my mannerism is perhaps not, not ideal. I have this kind of dry British sense of humor, which doesn't always translate even, even on a one on one basis, and certainly not always on Twitter. So, you know, my first instinct is that, oh, it's just kind of a misunderstanding. Uh, then there are people who have a genuine issue with me, like you know, they 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 think you know Mick West is just a debunker, or he's he's paid by the government, or you know he's he, he he's calling the pilots stupid, and so they 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 think these things about me, and so they're they're genuinely angry. But you know again that's kind of a misunderstanding. So I think of it like that. And then there's there's a few people who are just uh, you know assholes who aren't very nice, and those are the ones that end up getting muted. Uh, but most people, I assume, have good intentions, and I try to talk to them uh, with that in mind. So for you, I mean, do you ever feel that, you know, enough is enough? Have you ever wanted to walk away because <laughs> of the harassment that you take? Well, you see, the thing is, like, I think a lot of people, they, they see me talking on Twitter, and they think, oh, that's all Mick does. You know, he's just this guy who's a naysayer on Twitter when uh, a video comes out, Mick will just say, "Oh, that's a balloon," and uh, and you know that's all I do. But what what I'm actually really interested in doing, or what I spend my time doing, is actually doing these technical analyses. And the technical analyses, they're not anything to do with people or uh, personalities or insults or you know, miscommunications and things. It's just this this math and like research and detective work and collaboration with other people, like other people on, on Metabunk and sometimes even on, on Twitter and Facebook uh, and sometimes just over email. Uh, so that is, you know, it's, it's, it's separate from this whole drama that you see on, on UFO Twitter, which I don't really see myself as being part of. I don't, I don't really take part in this drama uh, uh you know i see that it's there and i know a lot of people get genuinely upset but what i'm doing is trying to figure out what's going on i'm trying to figure out you know in, for, say for one particular video what does this video show if someone had an experience uh what could that experience be you know, often you can't tell but sometimes you can sometimes you can figure these these things out um, but you know, the drama, I just try to stay away from it. It's not really my, my thing. And if people want to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to them. But if they want to shout at me, then I'm not going to shout back at them. I think that's a pretty, uh, strong attitude. I, I do. And, and, you know, I, I wish I had that because <laughs> Lord knows I, I, I can get sucked into a debate in no time, you know, but I'm trying, I'm trying, you mm. know, but. Mick, for you, I mean, have you ever seen a UFO or something that you can't explain in the sky? Is that part of the curiosity or are you just waiting for that moment? Yeah, I haven't really. I mean, I've had like little you know, things that you see that you can't identify. Like I saw a white dot high in the sky once and I couldn't tell what it was. And the funny thing was, like, you know, I've told this story before, like about seeing the white dot, but just yesterday, I, I saw another white dot. And I saw this, I was looking up and I saw this white dot and it moved across the sky, kind of in the same way that the, the ISS moves. If you ever watched the International Space Station yeah. move across the sky, it's a beautiful thing, bright light, moves relatively fast in a smooth, straight line across the sky. This thing seems to be doing the same as that, but it was in daytime. And it was this little white speck, like high above, and it was moving and it seemed in a perfectly straight line. I couldn't figure out what it was, and I was staring at it. And I said, "I wish I had my camera." And I said, "Oh, I do have my camera." Grab my camera out of my pocket, and you know, of course, I couldn't see anything because it was actually too small of a white dot for it to show up. And then I was puzzled for a while. I thought, "Good, what, what was that? Was that like a plane or a daytime satellite? Doesn't make any sense." And then I noticed another white dot, and this one was moving in a weird way. And then I noticed another one, and another one, and also I realized what I was seeing was just these these kind of seeds i'm not sure what it was cottonwood tree or something like that whatever the tree is here that that produces these seeds just blowing in the wind some of them when they're lower down you can tell what they are because they, they kind of move around like this but then i saw the ones that were really high up just appeared as these really small white little dots and they just move across the sky seemingly in straight lines it was it was very 
a very fun experience to discover that. And that's what I enjoy about this is figuring stuff out. And I was, I'm wondering now if like the, the white dot that I saw years and years ago might have been something similar, just like a little speck that wasn't as far as, away as I thought it was. It was something that's a bit closer, but it was far enough away that it moved smoothly across the sky. So that was a fun little experience. So what, what do you think that was overall? What do you think uh, what it would be if you're looking for an answer for that? Because I would say you had a UFO experience. Yeah, no, but I think like in the second experience, like I think I figured it out because I saw that there was others, these other white dots, which were just seeds and they were moving in the same way as the first one. But the thing was, I, I the first one I saw was by itself. Like, I didn't see any other dots but then i saw a whole bunch of them and then i got my camera out and i zoomed in and they were they were everywhere they were just like loads and loads of little white specks and the you know there's some of them fell to the ground and you can see them the little little bits of fluff with a seed in the middle of it you see you can see what they actually are but you go back to my first experience which was years earlier and all i saw was a white dot in the sky so i i couldn't figure out what it was and i think that's that's kind of a, a lot of people's experience is that they they see something that might be something like you know a seed or something and they can't figure it out of course a lot of people have things that couldn't possibly be you know explained by conventional means that, so they're seeing things like a a giant black triangle moving across the sky and things like that it's completely different to my experience but a lot of these ufos are actually things just like little lights you see these these videos all the time and people are just it's a light in the distance it could be anything See, I, I had my eyes open up in probably the last year with a, a good friend of mine. We call him a random guy around here who really opened up my eyes to a lot of what is actually ours and what is actually not ours. And I, I now believe probably 90, 95% of what we are seeing is one way or another man-made. But I still believe strongly in UFOs and, and my own experiences that I have had as well. For you being you know the fact that you've you've kind of had this experience what would make you believe as we've got about three minutes to go before the break here at the bottom of the hour what would make you believe that there are something or there is something visiting this planet i think you need evidence that's not ambiguous i think the problem with a lot of the evidence if not all of the evidence is that you know yeah it could be advanced technology it could be something that's moving really rapidly or it could be something something else like something either human made or some kind of illusion some kind of camera artifact you, you can't tell for sure that it's unambiguous so i would like evidence that you kind of can't argue with like if you have two or three different cameras uh, from reputable sources that are independent looking at the same thing and you see this this craft doing something amazing. You know, if something like a, a craft appeared above a major city, then you would have like a thousand videos of it. Uh, but all we ever get are these single videos. And when you get multiple videos, uh, the few times that has happened, it's almost always unfortunately turned out to be a hoax. Like there's one in Jerusalem, there was one in Texas, there's one in Santa Monica, there was one quite recently uh, where like there was two people claimed to have taken videos and it really just looks like it's a hoax but i would really like to see that multiple source uh data now just even just seeing something myself yeah, there's going to be questions i want to see multiple people seeing the same thing multiple people taking video of the same thing independently and from different different locations i mean that shouldn't be shouldn't be too hard uh to, to accomplish yes you know, it's not like you know every single thing is just one person out in the, the country taking a bit uh, by themselves. And there's plenty of places where UFOs have appeared where multiple people should be able to take take video of it. And I think we just haven't, we haven't got past that kind of ambiguity uh, level into something that's definitively weird or definitively, definitively anomalous. There's always a question about, is it actually anomalous? Is it a sensor error? You know, you see this in the UAP reports when they're talking about uh, these things, you know, a small percentage of reports uh, appears to demonstrate anomalous behavior, but we can't rule out things like sensor error, operator error, uh, or weird weather phenomena, or or uh, you know, mistaken identities and things like that. So, you know, I think there's definitely possibilities. Uh, 
Batman balloons. The what? Like Batman balloons. <laughs> the Batman balloon, yes. I mean, it's something that, you know, is it a, is it a flying uh, spaceship or is it a Batman balloon? It looks like a Batman balloon, but it could be, you know, a flying spaceship. And, and then you start butting up against, you know, oh, well, the pilot wouldn't have taken a, a photo of a Batman balloon. Well, maybe they would. Yes, uh, was it Mark Kelly at the uh, the NASA uh, conference t tell the story about how he saw a UFO and they went around and came back to check what it w actually was, and it was a Bart Simpson balloon. So you know, these things do happen, and if they hadn't gone round and checked, it would have remained a UFO. They would never have figured it out, and maybe they would take a photo of it, and the, you know, you get something that was Bart, Shim Bart Simpson shaped, uh, and it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be resolved. It would be ambiguous. Is it a is it a UFO or is it a balloon? So, you know, I think you know, striving towards uh, good data is a good thing, and people are trying to do that. You know, the RV Loeb and the Galileo project—they're trying to get good data, but we're not there yet. Mick West on Spaced Out Radio, known as the biggest skeptic in the UFO world, but you know what? It's a topic that he enjoys. He may not believe you, but he wants to believe. At least that's what I'm getting out of it. We'll be back with the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio when we return right after this. Stay tuned. Thank you for that first half hour. Remember, our YouTube audience can hear us uh, chatting here. It's just the radio side that can't right yeah. now. Hey, everyone. Yeah. I think it's a great conversation, my friend. I do. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I want to do more of this, really, to be honest, like, because I want to, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to clarify to people that I'm not the enemy, like, I'm, I'm someone who's trying to figure things out, and I think, yeah, through my own experience, I've, you know, kind of maybe become a bit biased because all the ones that I look into, they end up being either resolvable or not enough information uh, to resolve. And so it's been a bit kind of disappointing. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm, I would like to discover aliens. I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, I, I enjoy just figuring stuff out. I like analyzing these videos. See, you know, I, I just like going for the thrill. That that's about that's that's me. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. I went on a ghost hunt at our local museum the other day. Yes. And um, we had a FLIR camera and my friend's wife was using the FLIR and I was kind of standing in this barn and, um, <clears throat> and she asked me to wave because she thought she had her or me and her husband in the shot. And literally I put my, she goes, could you raise your hand higher, Dave? So I did. Hmm. The problem was she realized her husband was on the right and not the left right in front of me. And here was this figure inside the camera waving back at her <laughs> about five feet in front of me. And, I, and, you know, when I went back and I looked at it, the guy was still there. But before, you know, it always happens. Here's, yeah. here's the bullshit answer. You know, the minute I go to take the photo of it, it disappears. Right. right. That's what pisses me off. Yeah, FLIR cameras are a, a fun thing to play with. I've got like a, a little one that attaches to the iPhone. I think FLIR actually has a page on their website now where they, they explain a lot of the, you know, the things that people sometimes mistake for anomalies, uh, like, like you know, kind of after images. Like if you sit in a chair and then you get up, there'll be kind of an image of a person in yeah. that chair because it kind of transfers your heat to it. And of course, things like, you know, handprints on the wall yeah. uh, stay for a surprisingly long time. Uh, the heat from your hand. Your hand is actually pretty hot compared to the to the environment. Oh, yeah. So if you're in a cold house and you rest your hand on the wall for ten seconds, you're going to get a a hot handprint that will stay there for like a minute or two. So it's kind of oh, easy yeah. to to make mistakes with a FLIR camera. It's a lot of fun though. A lot of fun. Oh, they they are a lot of fun, and and uh, it's uh, I, I I bought it for my birthday, my 49th birthday, because uh, I saw one nice and cheap on. Um, on uh, Facebook Marketplace, and it's just a little handheld. It, it, you know, it goes out to maybe. I'm lucky if it goes out 125 feet. You know, 100 feet, 125 feet. But it, 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 it's a lot of fun, man. It's yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah, mine's a very small one. I can't remember what I got it for. I think it was originally uh, 
to look into like one of the old UFO videos, maybe the Chilean Navy video case, because that was kind of a thermal imaging thing. But maybe it might have been flat Earth, actually. I can't remember now why I originally got it. But it's, it's coming very handy because a lot of people use them. Uh, the flat Earth people use them to try to prove that, that moonlight is, is cold, like it's like negative heat. So they've got this weird idea about how the sun and the moon work and that uh, uh, and so i was explaining to them the flat earth people which is a, a difficult crowd to explain things to the flat earth people uh, yeah yeah what's actually going on with this with moonlight and reflections of heat and stuff like that fascinating stuff though i mean i learned a lot and that's one of the things i enjoy is just learning so much about um uh, science and technology i didn't really know very much about FLIR cameras um, like six years ago, and now now I know a lot. Yeah, I I love mine, and uh, you know we um, when we go out we uh, we got night vision and we got all that other fun mm. toys that it's yeah. that it's fun to put out there and see what happens. I don't consider myself uh, a researcher. I I consider myself you know number one an experiencer. Number two, I you know I I should one day. Uh, get my journalism degree out of mothballs and actually hang it on my wall mm. again. But, you know, it's, it's a, it's a weird combination being both, you know, because you want to have the call it down the middle journalistic side, but on the flip side, you have these yeah. strange experiences that not everybody else has had. And you're trying to explain them as, as logically as possible. It gets a little tough sometimes, you yeah. know, yeah, I think that's kind of a fundamental issue in ufology is kind of the experiencer aspect. You know, people have actually had a personal experience. Oh yeah, and it, it gives you a very different perspective on on everything. One, sorry to cut you off there, Mick. We're no going right. to come back right now. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. From Metabunk.org, Mick West is here tonight breaking down what he thinks UFOs are. Is ufology a thing? What's going on with it? Mick, thank you so much for being here tonight. Very much appreciate you. I'm glad to be here. Having fun. Good. I'm glad you're having fun. That actually makes me feel good. I'm getting a little giddy now. But uh, <laughs> Mick, there's a lot going on in the UFO world. There is okay, with all the news coming out of coming out of the Pentagon, coming out of Canada. David Grush coming out of nowhere, and and you know all of these groups are now forming. You know from from Enigma Labs to Galileo Project to uh, you know the the pilots group that. It just seems like there is this sub business and this subculture of ex-government or current government employees that are trying to get together under this UFO world. And, and I don't know if it's for profit. I don't know if it's for positioning on other positions, but what's your thoughts of, of everything as, as we look at the way it's starting to form right in front of us? Well, I think we're living in interesting times uh, for ufology. Uh, things are kind of coming to a head, really. Uh, I think, you know, in a way that they haven't really in the past. I mean, we're actually getting congressional hearings on things, and we're getting supposed witnesses coming forward who have seen things like, like you know, crashed crafts and landed craft and captured craft, and talking about things like alien bodies and things like that, and even, like, agreements with aliens and giant craft. All these things, like, that they claim to have evidence of and they claim to know where you know the the program is and where the, the the craft are stored and things like that it seems like something's got to give like either 
it's going to be revealed that these things actually exist, that these craft have been captured, or it's going to be revealed that the story is is not what Dave Grush thought it was. And that uh, I don't know what it's going to turn out to be. But my, my, my thoughts, you know, what on what will happen, I think, is that it probably won't resolve into being aliens. I think something else is going on. I don't know what. Uh, and that itself is going to be very interesting. But yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. Like when you say Dave Grush uh, came out of nowhere, well, he kind of he did and he didn't. Like he's actually been around for I think it's like you know over a year since he first met people. Like uh, I think he first met Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp at a Star Trek convention, and then later he was introduced to other people within this kind of community of people who are pushing for disclosure. Uh, and I think eventually he he kind of like met with uh, Lou Elizondo and, and Gary Nolan and people like that and Hal Putoff and uh, Eric Davis. And they all together are kind of you know, involved in various aspects of it, but it's all behind the scenes. So we don't know exactly what's going on and you know, what their motives are. Uh, so it's... It's a tricky one. It's, you know, you look at all these individual people. Like, what's uh, what's his name? The uh, Ryan Graves. You know, he's set up a podcast and a company, and he briefly worked for another company, uh, uh, Quantum Generative Materials, which is a, a company started by Deep Prasad, who is a guy who you know, like twenty five to forty million dollars of, of of capital funding to use. AI to generate new types of metamaterials partly based on what UAPs are doing, what UFOs are doing. So it's all, you know, there's, there's, there's money involved, but how are they justifying it? And what's actually going on behind the scenes? Do they know something that we don't? Is there something that's going to be revealed? Is there a secret program of reverse engineering based on craft? Or is it based on just, you know, these little bits of metal? Like you remember the the arts part, Linda Moulton yes. Howe, little triangle of metal with different layers of zinc and bismuth. Uh, was it magnesium and bismuth with a bit of zinc? Is it just that? Is there more? Do we actually have craft? Is is the craft thing just a, a conflation that's, that's happened because we have uh, SAPs that do reverse engineering, but that's mostly to do with captured foreign aircraft and things like that. And it's all being conflated with this bit of metal that someone found by the side of the road and sent to Art Bell. There's so many possibilities. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's actually really fascinating. I'm really looking forward to more being revealed. Yeah, I think um, Michael Shermer said recently on, on Twitter, Michael Shermer is another another skeptic you know we talked about me being like you know the the only person doing this but there are other people there's michael Shermer, there's uh, brian dunning he's just uh released a new documentary which is very interesting on the whole subject of ufos there are other people so michael Shermer, uh he said like basically bring it on yeah you know, let's investigate let's figure out what mike what dave grush is saying let's let's congress delve into it and that's what i want you look at my twitter uh feed my my pinned tweet on Twitter is basically saying I want Congress to investigate. I want to figure out what's going on because it's a very interesting situation and I want to know what's behind it all. Well, you know what? I think we all want to know what's behind it all. The problem mm. is those with the answers, Mick, they're not giving up anything. Yeah, but yeah, but are they going to be forced to though? If, if there is something going on, like, you know, I think I wouldn't be surprised if there was a uh, an SAP, a you know, secure access program, like top secret program, like a need to know basis, uh, compartmentalized top secret. So only a few people are read into it. If there is like secret programs like that, that perhaps are even hidden from Congress. Because I think the thing is like they're introducing legislation now saying that all SAPs have to be kind of explained to Congress before they can spend any money on them which means that law doesn't exist right now, which means that it's actually legal to do what they're doing. If they're having to make a law that says you have to say what you're doing, then that means right now you don't have to say what you're doing. So there, there could be someone might decide, oh yeah, like we should 
we should investigate Skinwalker Ranch, but we don't need to tell Congress about it. You know, we can send like a team of scientists to Skinwalker Ranch to study the possibility of a portal appearing above Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, Congress doesn't need to know about it. It's just black money and they're fine with that. It's not even that much money. So maybe there's stuff like that going on. Maybe the, there's a secret program to analyze what someone thought was bits of meta material. You know, something that somebody thought was a bit of a crashed alien craft and they that's off the books. You know, that wouldn't entirely surprise me if such a program exists. It would surprise me if they had intact or, you know, uh, crashed flying saucers but that's kind of another thing. So, yeah, I think something is going to be revealed. I think Congress is going to look into are there these secret access programs, uh, special access programs that are off the books, and they're probably going to be told about them in camera, like you know, in a, in secret in a, a secure facility. And either they're going to be explained to them and they'll say, oh, yeah, this is just we've been analyzing this Russian sub and we highly compartmentalize it. And some people got the idea that this bit of material from the skin of the sub that we were analyzing was a bit of an alien spaceship. And that's what happened. And Congress will be like, OK, and then they won't be able to tell us any of that because it's all top secret. Or perhaps they'll say, you know, we found this craft. We think it's an alien craft. And so we're analyzing it. And what do you want us to do? I mean, it's top secret. And Congress will, I don't know, what will they do then? What will we do, they do with that information? Will they tell us? I don't know. You have been at times known to be highly critical of the fighter pilots, highly critical mm -hmm. of, of some of the eyewitnesses that have gone on. I mean, what what to you is is good testimony? You know, we're because no, we're not going to get those videotapes. You know, like Lou Elizondo talked about the twenty-one minute tape. Chris Mellon talked about that, and, uh, and other videos that are out there. Mm -hmm. Because I think the public is very sick and tired of if you saw what I saw on yeah. video. You, you know, so when when it comes to the fighter pilots or the military personnel who've had these close encounters with these objects, what is good evidence to you? Well, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm critical of them, and that's kind of a. I think people start out and they say, you know, Mick calls fighter pilots stupid or, or like, you know, crazy or prone to making mistakes. I don't think that's what's happening. I think occasionally all humans, regardless of their levels of skill, can make mistakes. And when mistakes happen, they sometimes are significant enough that it kind of reaches someone's attention and the only ones that we are aware of are the ones that kind of a bubble to the top you know, people do thousands of things all the time like they land on the wrong runway but it's not a, you know it's not a big deal because you know, no one got killed and someone gets reprimanded and it's a mistake somebody made and someone makes a mistake like looking out the window and they misidentify something and they file a ufo report and then that filters up somehow and it becomes like something in in arrow's database and it becomes like this possible possible ufo but it could well be just simply a pilot making a mistake just an ordinary understandable mistake that that you know, not anyone could make but like a pilot could make pilots aren't immune to making mistakes so i think i'm not attacking people and saying these pilots are stupid i'm just saying pilots are normal human beings highly skilled highly trained highly experienced normally do wonderful jobs 99.999 percent of the time just like most people do and occasionally sometimes perhaps they make a mistake this isn't something that we can rule out we can't say it's impossible for a pilot to ever make a mistake it's impossible for a military pilot to possibly ever to make no mistakes ever in their entire career so you have to include that as a possibility especially if you're going to consider other possibilities that are kind of fairly extreme you know if we're considering there's the possibility that the pilot actually saw a giant football fields size you know flying saucer uh, versus the possibility that the pilot had a hallucination now you know sure like you know you say that oh the pilot had a hallucination it's like i'm calling the pilots crazy but i'm just putting that forward as, as a possibility as something that might have happened that i don't think you can fully uh, eliminate those possibilities because you know some some things happen that are uh, uh you know 
extraordinary sometimes that people make extraordinary mistakes pilots make extraordinary mistakes once the u.s navy shot down an iranian passenger jet because they mistook it for a fighter so terrible mistakes sometimes sometimes happen uh but yeah i i think the pilots are wonderful people who do great jobs most of the time and you know i've talked to them and i've, I've offered to talk to uh, them i've talked to i've talked to ryan graves like you know privately i've talked to um alex dietrich i have a, a episode where not an episode but like a, a youtube video where i talk to her and we discuss this and it's all very very friendly and we we talk about things in a rational way uh but yeah i just don't think you can rule out the possibility that even a highly trained and highly skilled person could make a mistake and I understand that, and I can appreciate that. But, you know, when you start getting deeper into the program where, you know, whether it's Lou Elizondo or whether it's, like we mentioned, mm. David Grush, or there are a number of other people coming out, you know, we've heard Marco Rubio say there are many others. I've heard as many as eight to ten others, just like David Grush, who are confirming these programs. How do you go about or what's the thought process going about, you know, questioning whether or not they're telling the truth to congress because if they don't tell the truth they're going to be in a lot of trouble yeah it's it's <laughs> it's one of those things that uh we're going to find out fairly soon i think we're going to find out like how much truth there is to this uh to this accusation i mean the accusation basically is that there is a a secret program of reverse engineering alien technology and that we have crashed flying saucers, some of which had bodies in them, and uh, the, this has been going on for uh, since the 1940s. You know, since this this uh, Mussolini uh, Italian thing that was the Pope helped bring to the United States. So there's a you know a lot of very specific claims, and but the, you know, the basic claim is that there's a special access program, and I think you know we should find out something about the veracity of that statement. Is there a special access program? Now, the question like, is is it is there aliens? Yeah, this is such a big question. It's not really something that you can kind of sweep under the rug. I think if alien technology is involved, there's so much interest now from Congress, I don't think it would be possible to put the cat back in the bag uh, if, if it actually is, that's what, if that actually is what's going on. Now, if it's something else, like a special access program, reverse engineering Russian and Chinese technology, then that might be something they'll be able to keep the lids on to a degree or kind of explain to a certain degree what's actually going on. But you know, I think you know, it's, it's such a significant thing. It's, it's the biggest story in human history, if, if it's real. And uh, you look at the actual attention that's being given to it is very minimal. There's very little media attention. And there's not even that much attention from people in Congress. People are more concerned uh, about about other matters, like you know, even just like you know, the weather and the flight cancellations and you know, the war in, in Ukraine and the, the Hunter Biden's troubles and uh, you know, you know, everything else that's going on, you know, Trump's uh, papers. You know, this is what's actually is in in the media and what's actually concerning people because we haven't actually got any meat yet. We've got you know this 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 one guy who's publicly made these 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 accusations. We've got other people behind the scenes uh, who seem to be confirming aspects of the story. But then you hear like the politicians who have who have heard these people, like Marco Rubio. You know, he talked about you know, talking to you know, hearing from other people. But what he said, he didn't really seem to have very much meat to it. it. It seemed kind of fairly vague as to what was actually going on. You know, there, there are, someone said they saw video or craft that they didn't recognize, but they might have just been looking at things like the Aguadilla video or the, the Omaha Sphere video, things that are highly ambiguous. Uh, and sure, you could argue that these things look like alien spaceships, but really they they are pretty, pretty ambiguous. So, yeah, I... <laughs> I'm really looking forward to more information coming out. Okay. What, what kind of information do you want to see? Do you want to see them come out with the Roswell bodies? Do you want to see them come out? Sure. With an actual yeah. space? But, would you, but Mick, what, 
would you believe that though yeah no I, I would i would i uh, if they actually produce something that can be studied by scientists that's a real bit of tangible physical evidence and if we have a ship then scientists look at it and they say yes this has these weird metamaterials yes this has you know controls for somebody with like with 12 fingers this is you know this is unambiguously alien this has isotope ratios that uh, cannot possibly be manufactured on earth you know if we actually have that confirmation of that actually happening then yes i would believe it but right now we have one person telling a story which sounds like stories that he's been fed by other people all the stuff he's saying sounds like bits of, of, of ufo law you know stuff maybe it's true but it's stuff that's been knocking around for years this isotope ratio stuff is is the type of thing that gary nolan and jack valet have been talking about for like a decade or so now uh, the meta material thing that's just you know linda moulton howe's piece of material it's a terahertz waveguide but is it really has anybody really done any like real significant analysis? I mean, Gary Nolan analyzes bits of metal, but he's not a metallurgist. He's he's a an immunologist, a computational biology immunologist. You're very talented, but he's not a metal expert. Uh, so if if we actually get these bits of tangible evidence out there, yeah, even if it's just photos and videos, if we get things that are real, you know, governments issued like bits of evidence and scientists can look at these things and we can actually analyze them and see what's going on and it, they seem to be anomalous then yeah i will accept that is something anomalous but we're not there yet and you know it'd be great it would be really amazing if if that evidence does come out but i'm somewhat skeptical about what's actually going to happen well I'm, I'm really looking forward to it though it's going to be very interesting either way so do you think then that these people who are coming out are, are talking fantasy about what they're alleging or do you feel there is truth in what they're saying but they maybe just haven't explained it well enough to the public i i don't know i think the bottom line is i don't know what's going on uh, i think you know, my best guess is there's probably like a combination of things going on like I've talked before, like about how I think there probably are special access programs. I mean, there's definitely programs that are top secret for reverse engineering foreign technology. We know that that exists. We know NASIC uh, is is an organization that has has a department that's called the Foreign Technology Exploitation Group, and their job is to take captured or observed foreign technology and reverse engineer it to try to like utilize anything that's in it uh, and to generate countermeasures uh, against it so this is a real thing reverse engineering of foreign technology and material is a real thing this material is kind of an interesting word like in in the military there's 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 two spellings of material material uh like with ending in i a l and material ending in i e l material which comes from the french word and when they talk about uh, reverse engineering material we always think about they like, they found like a bit of metal and the re reverse engineering it but material el actually means equipment so a tank or a plane or a ship is is material uh, foreign material exploitation so i think there, there could be this these layers of misunderstanding to some degrees based on the language that is used you know we're talking about analyzing material we could be analyzing a captured mig uh when people think we're actually just analyzing something like like a you know, meta material uh and pe people within these programs might refer to things as ufos uh or you know the, have a nickname for something like a flying saucer and because everyone's so compartmentalized within these programs they don't necessarily know what the person in the next room is is doing and they're not allowed to talk about it uh, they might use these little code words in 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 the lunch rooms to say like you know what how's what's your ufo like and then people you know, hear this and they think oh they're working on ufos and the stories grow and then there are all these people who strongly believe in the the extraterrestrial non-human intelligent narrative who are trying to promote it and so they convince people they talk to people and people get convinced and you know, i don't know but it's possible that dave grush has been convinced by people that these things are happening when 
they're not actually exactly as they're being described. You know, somebody else has for some reason thought that this program is analyzing alien UFOs when in fact it's analyzing Chinese UFOs. And then they tell Dave Grush about all this and he gets this idea and this, this fully formed thing and he starts talking to people like Hal Putoff and Eric Davis and they tell him about all the stuff that they, they think they've experienced over the years. And somehow he gets this this thing formed in his head. But I don't know, maybe I'm yeah, I'm just speculating here. I don't know what's going on. I would love it if it was cleared up a little bit and we could figure out what's actually going on. But uh, things, are, things are moving forward. Things will happen. As we get ready to go to break, we've got about 40 seconds here. But you know that all of those people are tied together one yeah. way or another. They're all tied. It always seems to come down to Hal Putoff and Jim Semivan and and this cast of UFO characters or or uh, Black Ops characters, John Alexander, to name another one, where they all seem to gather and everybody is intertwined with them. So if you're not believing something like, like, uh, like you said, Hal Putoff mm-hmm. and some of the things he's pulled, I mean, I can see where you're saying, well, how do I trust somebody else who's been involved with them? But I, I want to get more into that and, and the people involved When we come back on Spaced Out Radio, we are through one hour with Mick West tonight on Spaced Out Radio, his website, metabunk.org. Yeah, I'm having a great time. I hope you are, too, where we're getting a look at the other side of ufology. I think Mick secretly wants to have some aliens in his life. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, he needs some aliens. We'll try and find some. Let's drum them up. On Spaced Out Radio, hour number two next. If you love your woo, it's time to make a commitment to the third annual SOR Fan Party. This time, we're heading to Reno, Nevada and the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Tickets are $60 or $100 for VIP. With that, you get a free radio show, You get to hang out with celebrity guests from Spaced Out Radio, including our team, who are coming to hang out with you. You get to meet the entire team, like Science Bob, Merle, Melinda Leslie, Geraldina Roscoe, and more. It's a weekend packed with adventure, and we want you there. After all, we're doing this for you. Find out more and get your tickets at info at spacedoutradio.com and book your hotels today at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort in Reno, Nevada. Come join us for the SOR Fan Party, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Hey everyone, guess what? We do not have ugly swag. We have spaced out radio gear that you're going to want to wear. Why? Because no one wants to wear ugly clothing. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com and go shopping today. You'll be glad you did. And it's a great way to support our show. Once you get your gear, send us a picture of you rocking out in your SOR swag. Spacedoutradio.com. Shop there today. And make yourself look good. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here comes hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at YouTube.com forward slash spaced out radio do old Davey the favor hit that subscribe button the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club my chair my chair is your password use it wisely space travelers as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on spaced out radio our website spacedoutradio.com we have a plethora of features for you rock out to bumblefoot read the newswire check out our swag Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. From Metabunk.org, Mick West is with us debunking the UFO theory and what's really going on in the world. And and Mick, there's a lot of people out there who have had experiences, who who absolutely believe, and I'm one of them, 
who absolutely believe I know what I've seen. I know what I've, I've experienced. And, you know, there's nothing that could take what, what I've seen away or what people have seen away. And yes, it's anecdotal. 99.9% of it is anecdotal evidence. But this has us fishing for more, fishing for answers, fishing for anything that we can see that matches up with what the experiencers are experiencing. And on the flip side, I don't believe in disclosure. I believe we're in a confirmation that there is something strange out there. And, and you know what, it's hard to mix the two because I believe disclosure is open up that Pandora's box. Let us see everything that is in there from Roswell on forward. Where do you stand in regards to people who are having these amazing experiences? They're affecting their lives. They're affecting their jobs, their friendships, their families. Mm -hmm. You know, not everybody is having some sort of psychosis here or mental issues. There's a lot of people like myself who have had major experiences with other people who've witnessed the same thing. So how do we define this? Yeah, it's very difficult. Uh, I think yeah, I want to first of all talk about the word debunker, uh, which I think when I started out kind of investigating conspiracy theories, I was looking to things like, like chemtrails or flat earth, where I think using the term to debunk those conspiracy theories was, was fairly appropriate. You know, the idea that contrails are being sprayed by the government was you know, so obviously false that it seemed like a reasonable thing to say, I'm debunking this conspiracy theory. But when we're talking about uh, UFOs, it's not really just this one theory that is either true or false it's lots and lots of individual different people having these individual experiences and lots of different bits of individual pieces of evidence like all these videos and each one of those individual experiences or pieces of evidence is something that deserves investigation it isn't something that people should set out to debunk. You shouldn't set out to say, you know, this is obviously false. And I'm going to figure out why it's false and then demonstrate that it's false. You know, that's the wrong way of going about, about it. You should set out, you know, looking at each individual thing and saying, what happened here? Can we determine what what was going on? What are the range of possibilities of, of what happened? Uh, and not say, you know, this is this is obviously nonsense because we don't know what happened you know especially with eyewitness testimonies it's very difficult to form a a good hypothesis as to what happened when someone describes something that's kind of extraordinary you know lots of people describe large craft moving above them or, or at a distance or, or or in some way that is that's basically kind of impossible to come up with a scenario that kind of explains that uh, in a in a a way that's satisfactory. So we we're kind of uh, we end up with a situation where we have this eyewitness testimony from people who are deeply convinced about what they saw, and they're being very honest, and they're trying very hard to explain their experience and to relate their experience as accurately as possible. And yet we don't have any physical evidence as to what happened. And yet what they're describing doesn't make much physical sense often. It's not something that can really be readily explained, except by something like, you know, a uh, advanced technology craft. But we don't really have any evidence that such a craft exists. And so we, we're left kind of at an impasse. There's not a lot you can do to move that conversation forward. You, know, you can say that you had an experience. I don't know what that experience means i don't know what caused it i don't know what actually happened i wasn't there uh you were there uh and you know you you're trying to describe it as, as well as you can but can we actually move forward from that what do i do i can i can say i choose to believe that what you describe is something that actually happened and you know base my interpretation on that and you know, some people do that like jacques valet is a big UFO guy, and he, whenever he listens to a, a witness and experiencer, he's assuming that 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 experience actually happened, or 
that they they are perceiving it accurately because it was some kind of projected reality into their their mind but either way it's something it's something extraordinary uh but i i guess like i personally would entertain other possibilities that people might have been subject to some kind of illusion you know like if this they, they think they saw a big black triangle flying over perhaps it was a couple of planes in a certain configuration that just looked like a big black triangle it's just a possibility it's not a, something you have to consider and since i wasn't there i don't know how good the evidence is what they actually saw and in and but if i raise that possibility to someone it the conversation can go very bad because they the person then sees oh mick is just mocking me by giving this ridiculous explanation and yeah i can understand how that would seem to people so it's a difficult difficult thing to deal with i think you know you've got to acknowledge that lots of people you know, have had some experience we don't know if that experience reflects a real physical reality uh, or, or what it actually reflects but you know for that person it's very very real and you have to respect that but what's wrong with believing the story what's wrong with you when you see hundreds if not thousands of reports from around north america or the world where people who've never met each other are saying that they're having experience with the exact same thing now i realize and i say that realizing that there are people out there who are looking for their 5 10 15 minutes of fame no matter how they get that i do believe that but i think the majority of those who mm -hmm. had that experience there there some people out there who are how can i put it their lives have changed over this Oh, yeah. Their lives have been affected and they just want answers and they know the answers are sitting in a, in a Pentagon shaped building and they're not getting them. Yeah. So how, how, how do we find that balance between, between, you know, an anecdotal story that's affected somebody emotionally and in their life comparatively to what is being held back? It's, it's a very difficult, uh, subject to address uh kind of precisely for like the way you've outlined it there these things are super important to the individual i'm sure to you as well individually and to a lot of people in the audience you know, you've had this experience which to you uh, was incredibly real and you know, represented some some physical reality that you you think you perceived but to the outside world they have no way of verifying that you know someone like me or i guess a nun experience or someone who hasn't had a similar experience uh you know, do yeah it's it's very difficult for me to to accept that all these people uh had an actual experience you know there's 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 kind of disconfirming evidence for that as well like the fact that there's very little uh, photographic and video evidence to corroborate it and I know people have various opinions about why that is but for me that that's kind of a big sticking point lots of people describe these things in great detail but we almost never get good uh, or even reasonable or halfway reasonable uh, videos of these things uh, there's actually a lot of variety there's you know you've seen like probably these posters of all the different UFO shapes that people have seen Yes. And sure, like some of them resolve into fairly common shapes, like a sphere. And it's obviously the most common shape is a sphere. That's just because any light in the sky or any dot that's sufficiently far away that you can't make out the details tends to look like a sphere. So people will describe it as such. Uh, people do like see you know, what they describe as tic tac shaped things. You know, they used to describe them as cigars. And you know, when whenever people actually take video of these and we're able to get enough information about what they're seeing they end up being uh, distant planes you just can't see the wings because the wings are not being lit by the sun so you see the fuselage and it looks like a cigar and now people say you know it looks like a it was like a tic-tac shape uh because you know tic-tac became you know just a popular descriptor after the, the nimitz incident so I, I see these things where people have described something but when they actually try to produce the evidence of it that doesn't really match up and then there's so much variety and then just what we know about um you know this is this is going to be a difficult thing to talk about what we know about human psychology you know we know that people's memories are not as good as they think you know this is something that has been studied 
with things like, say, uh, the 9-11. Yeah, everybody remembers where they were when 9-11, when they first heard about 9-11. They've got this, what they call a flashbulb memory, and it's very, very vivid, this, this memory that you have, because like, this is such this incredible event that happened. But in memory researchers at the time, they recognized that you know, this, this big event was actually an opportunity to study uh, what goes on in people's memories. So they got people to write down what they were thinking and what they were feeling and where they were when they first heard that the 9-11 attacks had happened and the World Trade Center ha had collapsed. And so they, they stored all these, these records. And then they went back like a few years later and they asked people again. And a significant number of those accounts actually changed. People misremembered things that they that should have been flashbulb memories, should have been these things that you, know, you couldn't possibly forget, things like where you were when you heard the news. And yet some people did. So it shows that you know, even when you think something is so amazing that there's no way you could possibly misinterpret it or misremember it, unfortunately the brain, our brains, my brain, isn't as good as I, as I perceive it to be. You know, my memory is fallible, my perception is fallible. But this is very difficult to talk about. You know, you personally may feel you know, uncomfortable because I'm bringing these things up and because it, it casts doubt upon your story uh, and your, your recollection. And other people definitely have had that reaction and they get very angry at me for even suggesting these things. But, you know, these are unfortunate realities of the human, uh, human brain. Well, I think some people, though, they want to be heard. Okay, they want to be heard. They want to be able to have somebody believe them. I think for a lot of experiencers, they just want someone to believe mm. their story or their account of what they perceive they saw. And and I don't have an issue with that because I think it's pretty easy to see when someone goes into some run on BS rather than sticking to the facts of what they know. I, you know, I've had people on this show try to pull the wool over my eyes about their experiences. Mm. And, and sometimes you got to call BS on it, you know, and, and it goes apart with the job that I do. But f for, for most people out there, I think that there is a trauma that goes along with that experience that most people who've never had an experience or are skeptical of it, don't understand the physical traits that kind of go along with that. So, I mean, there is physical evidence of it. It's a matter of whether or not you take the time to, to actually go through that, you know, whether it's, you know, abduction or whether it's the nightmares or, or, the, or mm -hmm. everything that goes on. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, I was three feet above my bed hmm. and smacked my, my partner right across the back when I landed. I, dude I'm, I'm 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 a chubby guy if you haven't noticed you know i i just don't float three feet above my bed right right but, but i mean you, i know I, yeah. woke, I know i woke my partner up when i when i hit the bed and smacked her across the back you know so i mean there is all of these little things that add up yeah no i mean like something an experience like that like obviously it seems very real in your recollection uh and in the experience at the time but you know i've had experiences in in my bedroom that have you know defied all physical explanation like I, I i for quite a long time i had experiences where these giant spiders would descend from the ceiling towards me uh and you know i would actually see them and i would jump out of bed turn on the light and you know try to find the spiders and i would be terrified uh and this is a relatively common thing you know it's, it's kind of uh, i think it's hypnogagic hallucinations as you're falling asleep you know there's a kind of disconnect between your your brain and your body uh, where you're actually dreaming but you you feel like you're you're actually awake and you feel like you're actually in in the room so you know the experience like yours where you're floating above the bed to like a, you know scientist types they would say there's a perfectly reasonable explanation of that it's just that you had a hallucination and then you since you you know, it's just like the, the typical thing when you're falling asleep and you feel like you're falling and you, you kick out. In this case, it was a bit more extreme in that you thought you were like floating above the bed and so you, you thrashed around and you, you hit your partner. Uh, so there was, there was, there's an available explanation there from the scientific thing. I'm not saying that's what's happened, but since that explanation exists, you're 
evidence, unfortunately, it oh, uh, falls I into guess. that level of ambiguity where you can't actually say there's anything definitive, definitive, definitive about it. Uh, but it's you know, certainly interesting. Well, I know uh, waking up my partner with her screaming at me with a couple of f bombs was <laughs> yeah. not very healthy. I can tell you that, Mick. Let's get to some audience questions here. Yeah, they are, they are piling up, and let's start off with uh, Tim here. What has your research determined on some of the scientific results being shown at places like Skinwalker Ranch? Ooh, um, <laughs> good question. Well, yeah, I've looked into a bunch of the different claims that they made on Skinwalker Ranch, and they're, they're not very good, uh, I guess is my, my bottom line. The, the science that they, they put forward is, is, is pretty poor. I, for example, I've, I've been trying for a while to get Brandon Fugel to release the data from this, this bottle drop experiment that they did, which is where they took a helicopter up above you know, this triangle area they thought was an anomaly, and they dropped bottles with GPS receivers in them. They recorded GPS data, and then they said that they recovered one of the bottles, and it showed like, it bounced off something. And you see in the show that it bounced off something. And yet they don't really do any science with the data. They don't really they do any analysis of it. They just display it on screen and Travis Taylor gets up and goes, yeah, you see right there, it's a kind of a kink, like it moved to one side. But they could very easily do some good analysis on that data. Let's figure out what the acceleration is, figure out where it is in 3D space, allow people to look at it from different angles. But no, they just they just show something on screen and they make this broad sweeping statement about it and then uh, they, then they move on. They don't do any any real analysis. And then there's there's constantly been things historically where they've they've done things like they get their little um, tri meter out, their tri field meter, and they they see these numbers on them and they, they say mean things and like Travis said, this is like you know, more than you get from the inside of a microwave oven when it was actually you know what you'd get from a cell phone or like what you'd get from the little radio packs that they're wearing on their belts. They they keep saying there's radio interference when they they're ignoring the fact that they're surrounded by these like Wi-Fi routers and these these little wireless microphones and things. And this is there's a constant litany of of failings on Skinwalker Ranch. You know, Brandon, I think, I I feel like Brandon Fugel, the owner of Skinwalker Ranch, is being honest, largely, about doing science. And I think uh, uh, Eric Bard is is being honest. And I think most of the other cast members are, are being pretty honest. Uh, they think that they're doing good science. Most of them are not scientists, the other cast members. But the science that they display on the show is really very, very bad. But that's television, man. If we're going to sure. judge everything on television, we're going to say not finding Bigfoot is a great show. Yeah, but it's television. The, the people involved claim is real. Travis Taylor, lead scientist, chief scientist of the UAP task force, claims that the work he is doing on uh, ancient aliens and Skinwalker Ranch is real science. He says it's real stuff that they're actually doing there. So yeah, sure, it is television, but why is Travis Taylor saying that it's real? You know, is he is he lying when he's at a at Alien Con and saying these are all real phenomena that are actually happening? Is this all part of a show and? How how can he be doing this, like lying in public about that and also being on this UAP task force? It doesn't really make any sense. And the, the, the scientific presentations that he's done, I, mean, I talked a bit about this in my last video. He did this one where he analyzed this, this wibbly pattern on the gimbal video saying that it was an interference pattern when actually it was just video interlacing. It was interlaced video. It was just this ridiculous mistake that he made that he should know better. And he, he, it's not like the only mistake he's made. He's, he's done a bunch of things like that. Yeah, and it's, uh, it doesn't speak well to the quality of the science that was in the original UAP task force, if that's the type of science he was doing there. Well, the problem is that they're taking a weeks, of, weeks of footage and breaking it down to 42 minutes. I mean, the yeah, editor is the, the actual scientist of it all. You know, so we don't really know what what has hit the floor that could be a lot more evidence than, 
you know, watching rockets, yeah. uh, rockets go up into, into the atmosphere. Well, but they show us things that are pretty specific. Like they showed us this video of like what they said, this is a, a little orb and it's following this helicopter and Brandon Fugel's like on camera saying, look, it is lit in the exact same way as the helicopter is lit. It's shiny, but it wasn't, it was, they were using something called, uh, the emboss filter standard like video slash photo filter that makes things look like they are shiny so you take a little speck on the screen you get the emboss filter it's going to make it look shiny and it's going to look the same as the helicopter because the the filter's making the helicopter look shiny and they did this whole segment about this this thing and they stood up travis taylor says look it look it's got two hemispheres no that's two hemispheres is part of what the emboss filter does so they're showing us all this stuff on tv but yeah, maybe there's some real science, but why didn't they show us the real science? Why did they show us all these mistakes that they made and not own up to these mistakes? It doesn't really make any sense. I blame the editor. I blame <laughs> the editor. That's what I do. You went in doubt, blame the editor. It's just much easier than, than watching Zach Bagans it's... run around uh, screaming at everything that you can't see or hear, you know? So there is that Mick, we got you for another 30 minutes here on spaced out radio. We're having a great show, and I hope you're having a good time with us as well. Metabunk.org is Mick's website. You either love him or you don't, <laughs> but I can tell you this. You get an honest answer of what he feels is what is going on in the world today, and that's why we're so glad to have Mick West on our program tonight. It's a little bit different than what we normally do, but this is how we learn. This is how we bring it all together on Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. We enter the second half of the show right after this. All right, we are clear, my man. All righty. We are clear. That was a good half hour. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, Skinwalker Ranch is very... <laughs> I kind of stopped following a skinwalker ranch um like a few episodes ago it just i guess the the dave grush stuff coming out was much more interesting but the skinwalker ranch he just got to be too ridiculous really yeah they're constantly well, doing these 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 bad science things like uh it was that that thermal camera footage that they did of <coughs> when they shot a rocket up it was just which was just the reflection of of the the fireball from the rocket being launched. It was just so, I don't know, egregiously bad science that uh, <laughs> it kind of turned me off the you whole thing. I'm really surprised, though. Like, and I know Tim Senor, my UFO report guy, uh, him and I have talked about this both on and off the air. But I don't, I'm really surprised that more people didn't focus on that story that, you know, uh, Travis Taylor. You know, here he was playing television scientists yeah. on, on the, there and nobody focused on the fact that he was living a double life. And, you know, if you're holding that position within Space Force, uh, shouldn't that have been brought forward, you know, as one of the top scientists of Space Force? And, you know, to me, that that just led to a little bit of the of the runaround that we get in this community. Yeah, no, it's 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 kind of weird, and I think maybe people don't talk about it because they don't really understand what the situation is. You know, people don't really follow things like the Skinwalker Ranch situation. You know, Skinwalker Ranch is is a huge part of ufology. Uh, it's it's kind of like it's the foundation of of ORSAP and ATIP. Goes back to Skinwalker Ranch, you know, Harry Reid's involvement, and. Uh, 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 Robert Bigelow, you know, all this stuff kind of is rooted in that, you know, Hal Putoff, you know, all those people, they go back to, to, you know, Skinwalker Ranch and beyond, you know, Hal Putoff's previous, uh, uh, involvement in this thing, the, the NIDS investigation and, uh, you know, what came before that, like the, the other, you know, people going back, you know, Jack Valet, the, the old invisible college. But it, there's this side of it that's a bit, I think, almost like a bit too weird for the mainstream media to get their teeth into. You, you try to talk about how you know, Skinwalker Ranch was a part of the story, and they, they just don't want to hear about it because it's so weird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can see that argument, you know. 
I could tell, I do believe there are properties out there um, regarding regarding high strangeness. I know my friends, you know, where I had the majority of my experiences, my friends had 10 acres of, of woo, man. It was, yeah. it was the strangest, strangest yeah. place I'd ever been. And that's what kind of switched over my whole belief pattern, you know, but I, I wouldn't put it on TV. That's yeah, for but sure. Like, the thing with that is that you, if you do have 10 acres of woo, you should be able to do some science to demonstrate that there's something going on there. And yet you get like, you know, the ultimate, like, I think it's is it, yeah, several acres of woo in Skinwalker Ranch, supposedly the, you know, the most amazing place ever. And we're not getting any results. You know, you're sure we, they say they are on TV, but it's, it's just nonsense stuff. It's just that, the, you know, the hand waving uh, over little wibbles in uh, some EMF spectrum and uh, saying it means something, but they're really not getting any repeatable results out of their multiple acres of woo. And I think if if you have, in science, if you have something that's repeatable, if you have something where high strangeness is always happening, then you should be able to do some experiment to actually demonstrate that. And we haven't got that. Well, I think on uh, my friend's property when he owned it, it was more a fact that, you know, none of us were scientists. We were all in awe of mm -hmm. what was going on. I mean, Mick, it was something different like each and every night and literally it was almost every night there were things happening there, you know, from hauntings to UFOs flying over yeah. to uh, Sasquatch encounters, shadow <laughs> people. I mean, it was, yeah. like, it, it was right out of a, out of a, a fiction novel, you know, and, and uh, it was crazy. It yeah, was, it but was unfortunately crazy. like now all that gets you is a bunch of cool stories. Uh, Absolutely. We didn't, we didn't get any solid evidence out of it. And you know, Skinwalker Ranch is ostensibly trying to get solid evidence out of their acres. But, you know, we're not really getting anything that the scientists can really put their teeth into. And when, when they do, you know, I've been asking Brandon Fugel for this data, small bit of data. It's like two megabytes of data, if that's something you could like, you know, you could probably print out and give it to me. It's like such a small amount of data. Sorry, here we go. Yeah. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very glad to be right here with you for this amazing journey. Reminder to all of you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Final time tonight, we got Mick West here from Metabunk.org. That's his website. Yep, we're asking audience questions here for you, Mick. I know all we're right. not going to get through all of them, but we're going to try and get through as many as possible here in the next 30 minutes. Our right. Keith Andrews is asking, have you ever encountered a video you could not functionally explain? Yeah, all the time. Uh, problem is that the ones that you can't explain are the ones that don't have enough information in them. So you ended up with, uh, you know, here's, here's a little light in the distance. I can't explain it. Doesn't mean that it's something amazing. I mean, what people are really asking when they ask that question is like, have you seen a, a video that makes you think that it could possibly be, you know, non-human intelligence or or aliens, and and unfortunately, no, I haven't. Yeah, you know, I've I've seen lots of videos I can't explain, but it's just because they're not very good videos. All right, let's go to Max here. Have you ever analyzed the Skinny Bob videos? Uh, not really. I mean, there's the thread about it on MetaBunk. Uh, I think you know, it seems like. It seems like a pretty obvious fake, really. People have analyzed it and they've determined that the 
the noise pattern on top of it, the kind of grain pattern, is like from stock footage, and they found the actual stock footage that was used uh, to to overlay uh, on the, these videos. But then people would just say, oh, well, that's just something that they did to misdirect people, and it's actually real video, and then they added this to create a different version. But, you know, you're just layering something upon something else there. I don't, I, it didn't seem worth analyzing because it's something that you can create using CGI, and there's no real provenance. There's no real indication that it's anything other than that. So I, I didn't really seem like it'd be worth time analyzing. Kevin Day on Facebook, you know him from the Nimitz incident. Mm -hmm. He is asking, Mick, if you were asked to testify before Congress, would you consider it? Sure, yeah. I'm not sure why they would ask me, though. I mean, what are they going to say? Like, Mick, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what Break do you think down, of all these of videos? But definitely, I would definitely uh, testify before Congress. And you know, if, if they wanted to just get a skeptic's perspective on, on the evidence, then I would give it. But yeah, not a problem. Philip Blair wants to know, what do you think of UFOs that show up on radar? I would like to see the actual data. There's there's very, very little and very sparse actual data that we've got from, from radar. Like radar now is pretty amazing. You can, you can basically get 3D motion tracks of, of, of objects uh, uh, in space. And if UFOs were showing up on, on radar, I think they would be showing up on the FAA radar and the NORAD radar and the, the unfiltered FAA radar, which they do actually store the unfiltered radar. But you know, there isn't any. We've got maybe some like really old radar. We don't actually have the data. We just have some like you know screenshots and things like that. So I think if things do show up on radar, a lot of the times it's going to be glitches. Some of it might be real stuff, but you know, we don't have anything that's kind of unambiguously weird that is definitively like uh, correlated with something that somebody has seen. So it you know it would be a great source of correlating data, but I don't think we've got any good data yet. Nikki in Seattle is asking, uh, Nick, what's your take, opinion, or viewpoint on ET abductees? Well, again, there we we're really lacking in the physical evidence. Like, if people were being abducted from their rooms at the rate that some people suggest then it should be relatively straightforward to demonstrate this. Like, you know, people would have cameras that show something happening, like, you know, maybe even their external security cameras. I mean, are they being abducted by being teleported uh, out of their rooms? Or are they, do pe people come in and take them? Or what, what's actually going on there? It's one of these things that it's a story that has plausible explanations in science, which is that essentially people have dreams or hallucinations of things like people in their rooms. So there's that aspect of it. And then you have people's recollection, which seems like they're, they're, from their perspective, it seems very, very real. But un unfortunately, that's also what happens with these types of hallucinations. Uh, so because we have a plausible scientific explanation for these really weird events, and we don't have any physical evidence that these events actually happened, then there's not not a lot we can do in terms of kind of you know forming any any hypothesis about you know what it might be other than this 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 you know hallucinations and whatnot perhaps there's something going on there but how do we demonstrate that how do we demonstrate it beyond just listening to the testimony of people it's uh it's a tricky one because you know again we get we butt into this this difficulty of of like, if you don't believe the person, are you disrespecting them? Uh, are you, um, you know, insulting them? Are you calling them crazy? So it's a difficult subject to discuss. But unfortunately, we know things like hypnagogic hallucinations happen. Sleep paralysis is a real thing, and it can result in memories and experiences just like uh, have been described. So it's a tricky thing, but the evidence doesn't really stand up as a, a solid physical thing. What does, uh, what about the studies of, of Gary Nolan at Stanford regarding alien abductees or what they're doing yeah. at Rice University? Yeah. Uh, Gary Nolan's study, like they, you have, basically they were studying people who thought that they'd had, uh, a, 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 a ET experience and they thought that they'd been harmed by it. And he found this um, 
this you know larger than normal uh i think it's the called the cadet pudet camptum i can't remember exactly what the word is but part of the brain had more uh connections than normal and it, originally he thought this was actually being caused by the the experience the abduction but then he found out that like these things were actually pre-existing uh so they weren't actually being caused by it so then he thought that perhaps there's a correlation which like people who have a specific type of brain uh are more prone to having this this type of experience and that might be true i mean maybe that it's actually they have more sleep hallucinations you know maybe also you know their brains are more receptive to a certain type of interdimensional communication from from non-human intelligence but the sleep hallucinations thing seems more plausible to me of course you know it's very difficult to talk to the individual about that because you know for the reasons i've discussed earlier all right, moving on here. Let's go to Derek. Mick, what, what are your thoughts? Do you believe the Senate committee is going to take over disclosure over the House committee? Hmm, well, I don't know about that. It uh, seems like kind of a procedural uh, type of thing. But, yeah, I mean, the the, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, um, yeah, with this, uh, was it uh, Mark Warner and Marco Rubio, uh, they seem to be looking into it. And you know, I expect something to come out of that. You know, people are holding hearings as well. Uh, so I don't know who's going to do it, but yeah, you know, I, I expect things to happen in the future, in the near future. Okay, continuing on, let's go to B. Baker. What researchers in the UFO phenomena field do you think do good work? Mm, I, I'm terrible with names, so I, 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 I'm going to have a very hard time kind of bringing anybody, uh, uh, anybody's name up. I don't know. Who do you think? Do you have like uh, favorite people? Oh, I do, but it might are all. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I love, I love the work of Grant Cameron. Uh, Nicole Sackage does great work. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I enjoy Richard Dolan. I enjoy uh, Geraldine Orozco from a, a spiritual sense. You know, my, my mind kind of goes a little bit all over the place with everything. But I also like, you know, the scientific side of things. Uh, Dr. Bob McGuire, Dr. Michael P. Masters. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I guess like I I, I, I have a difficult time answering that question. Yeah, I've, I've talked to some people like Gary Nolan and, and Jack Vallee, and they do some good work. There was an investigation I did on these these hairdryer burns where people have these burns on their bodies that looked like hairdryers, and I you know I investigated it and found that it, you know it seemed to be hairdryers, and it seemed like when I talked to Jack Vallee about it and Gary Nolan, they'd done the exact same work. They'd done good work. They'd done this investigation and they did all this stuff. They just didn't publicize the fact that it was hairdryers uh, in in a lot of cases because they didn't want to dissuade people who had genuine strange marks on their body from coming forward so you know a lot of people do very good work you know people like the scu a lot of the stuff the scu does is good detailed work but you know they also mess up a lot uh so you know it's people you know i i mess up too uh so i don't know i don't know it's a difficult difficult question to answer because <laughs> i think we'd have to get, get into specifics there but i get you well, we don't have enough time, to be honest. We we could go another two hours with yeah. this. All right. Too Big over on Twitch is asking, Mick, what are your thoughts on the likelihood of intelligent life elsewhere and the possibility of contact across the vast distances involved? I, I think uh, it's pr pretty much 100% that there's intelligent life somewhere in the universe. Uh, I think the chances of it, of it contacting us are yeah, unknown, but I would tend towards them being fairly small. If you watch uh, Brian Dunning's new documentary, which is only just released, I'm not sure where it's streaming yet, if, if anywhere, uh, it, he talks about that in, in some detail and goes over the arguments. And you know, the problem with, with intelligent life is that it probably lasts in a cosmic scale not very long. You know, It's just like a blink of an eye. So the chances of it existing at the same time as us and close enough to visit us are probably fairly small, unless it's actually you know, lasted long enough to spread through the entire galaxy and we don't see any evidence of that. I want to ask you, uh, just away from the audience questions here, 
What about NASA? Okay, what? to me, NASA yeah. is the is a big player in this who are treating the public as morons, as <laughs> a bunch of idiots. And Damn, when I, I hear, say that. No, I would. And, oh, okay. and, and I'll explain why. Yeah. Okay. When when Bill Nelson gets yeah. in front of his first press conference and for no reason brings up the UFO side and then goes on to, you know, doesn't even mention NASA talking about all the fighter pilots and how he's impressed about all this. Then they hold this bogus study uh, that they spend a hundred grand on complaining that they now need $50 billion in order <laughs> to get the tech going. You know, we knew that was coming. But for decades, there has been evidence of the astronauts and pilots on recordings claiming what they have seen and what they are experiencing while out in space. Darcy Weir, who's a great documentarian, has done uh, has got the audio for that and put it into the documentaries of the actual voice footage from these. And NASA just sits there and denies it. And and doesn't even want to get into the subject matter. Yeah. To me, that's a travesty. Yeah, I think there's two very different subjects there. I mean, NASA's current thing is, I think it's basically just Bill Nelson as being convinced by you know, the, the current wave of, of testimony and, and videos and stuff that there's something to it. And so he ordered uh, this new investigation and NASA is somewhat reluctantly uh, doing it. I mean, they'd rather do, do SETI-type work uh, rather than this then the other stuff like the you know the evidence from the astronauts uh it's usually pre it's pretty old stuff but you know, you know and it's very compelling to some people it's not something i really looked into that much uh like interpreting what people describe on some audio recording is kind of difficult unless you can actually talk to that person and you know uh, ask them what they actually meant uh when they said something you know they could just be like a a loose piece of equipment or something floating around or bits of ice and things like that. It's obviously very easy to, to kind of hand wave it away, but we, bottom line is we don't actually know what they saw or what they were actually referring to uh, in those, those audio segments. All right. Continuing on Nikiana, first time listener in our chat room, what physical evidence would suffice? Well, a flying saucer would be great, but uh, uh, failing that, just good video and good photos of something actually doing something, like close-up photos of, of, of good craft from multiple witnesses. This is what you really want. You want more than one uh, video, more than one photo of the same thing that's demonstrating something like you know, either hovering or, or moving at incredible accelerations. So I think that's kind of the baseline, and anything more than that would be, would be great, but you know, we haven't even got to that yet. Okay, continuing. We're racing through here. Let's go to Philip Blair. Mick, have you examined the scholarship of UFOs done by atmospheric physicist Professor James E. McDonald in the 1960s? If not, would you? Uh, people bring it up. I haven't really looked into it that much because I, I don't think there's a lot you can get out of these really old stuff like the 1960s. I mean, that's like 60 plus years ago, like 60 years ago. Uh, it's it's very old, stale evidence that if nothing has come of it by now, me looking into it isn't really going to change that. I love this question from LM. Mick, what is your second favorite hobby aside from your hobbyist day job that served you? <laughs> My second favorite hobby. Uh, well, I, I like photography. I like taking photos. And... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, what's, uh, what, what do people do as hobbies? I watch, uh, I watch TV with my wife. I play backgammon. I uh, go cycling. I go for hikes. I do a whole bunch of things that normal people do. And I also in, investigate UFO videos. I'm going to be honest with you. That sounds like a, a singles profile right there. <laughs> Pete wants yeah. to know. Mick, can you outline a proper science plan or methodology for UFO study? Uh, well, yeah, you, for, for science, you want stuff that's repeatable. So you want data that kind of correlates with other data. I mean, ideally, you want to be able to get something that happens over and over again, and you can repeat it. Uh, but yeah, you know, if if you can't get that, you, you want to try to establish patterns in the data. You know, what, what, what you're doing there with uh, ufology isn't so much 
kind of analyzing little signals and whatnot. What the claims are is that we're actually seeing physical craft and we actually have physical craft and we have this, you know, all these sightings all the time. We shouldn't be just trying to like figure out patterns in the data. We should be able to actually have video of the actual thing. So I, I really actually think, you know, RV Loeb's approach is quite reasonable. If, if these things are actually happening, then get much better cameras that are dedicated to try to take really good photos and videos of these things. Yeah, if, if, if pilots are seeing things all the time, then put cameras on planes that are as good uh, resolution as the, ca as the pilot's eyes that are looking out at the skies all the time, and eventually you're going to catch a, like some UFOs. I mean, shouldn't, if they're seeing them all the time off the coast of, of Virginia, beach on the east coast you know ryan graves says they were seeing them every day go out and follow them and see what they're actually doing like you know if, if there's a repeatable situation get in there and start uh, digging into it it shouldn't be that complicated i guess like the problem is is money like it costs a lot to do these things and because we don't have the baseline evidence that suggests that these things are real it's hard to justify spending the money but yeah rb loeb's got some billionaires to give him some money so that's good Maybe something will come yeah. from that. I'd like some of that. I'm not going to lie. I'm, yeah, I, I, I'll take it. Yeah, and I would too. All right, let's go to Jules. How do you account for anomalous health effects from proximity to the phenomena, mm. which has been documented in military records such as Rendlesham and others? Well, I think like if somebody has an experience with a UFO and then like 20 years later they get cancer, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know one thing caused the other. Right? The... The guy who in from Rendlesham who g got ill, and you know, he recently had some senator, I think, or a congressman, uh, get him a veteran status and saying that his illness was related to his service. Uh, people interpret that as meaning that the, his illness was related to what happened in Rendlesham Forest, but there's no real evidence that there's actually any correlation there. And this is this is the problem. It's, can you get correlation between one thing and the other? I mean, it's hard enough with things like uh, Gulf War syndrome or the, the, the toxic burn pits or, or the 9-11 dust. There's all this contest, contested causation for things that are fairly self-evident like that. Then you've got something like you know, a guy saying, you know, I, I had an experience with a UFO and now I have uh, leukemia it's very difficult to actually demonstrate a correlation between those things. Continuing on, Too Big is asking, Nick, what are your thoughts on the likelihood of intelligent life elsewhere? Or I think we've already asked that, that question. Way. I apologize. Uh, let's go to Pixie Lara. Mick, have you done any boots on the ground research in any places of reported repeated cases of UFOs or other phenomena? If so, where? If not, would you if the opportunity arose i i have not i would like to i got invited to skinwalker ranch but i think that uh um invite has evaporated due to my continued uh, uh criticism of the show uh but yeah if someone's got something near sacramento that's uh, where things are happening on the regular then uh yeah we'll be happy to to look into it but uh but no i i haven't actually been to any any place like that is there a specific case you would love to know more about that you are like, hey, if this is going to convince me, this is the case? Would it be Roswell? Would it be the Phoenix Lights? Would it be something different? Yeah, it doesn't really matter, actually, which one it is. Like anything that can actually unambiguously demonstrate something something amazing. I mean, there's, there's cases I'd, I'd really like to figure out, like Gimbal, uh, the Gimbal video and the GoFast video and the, the Nimitz encounter, just because I've done looked into them so much that I'm just really interested in, in figuring out, you know, I'd, yeah, I'd be happy if it was shown to be like uh, an amazing flying craft in Gimbal, but uh, I'd also be happy if it was just a distant plane or whatever it ends up being. I, I would like to know. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I don't really care which, which one it is. Just show me the money. That's what it comes down to. We got one more question here. Uh, from our audience, Bad Daddy. What about implants that surgeons have removed from people for years? Yeah, well, uh, people get bits of metal embedded in them. I mean, this is just a fact of human existence. You know, people fall and they have an injury and they end up with a bit of like a stone or a bit of metal or something embedded in them. 
And then 20 years later, they're completely forgotten all about it and it works its way out and they think it's an implant. And people do x-rays and they find things embedded in, in inside people. It's something that, yeah, again, there is a plausible scientific explanation for it. But other people choose to interpret it in a different way. Uh, the things that they remove, you know, they're not anything. They're, they're just bits of metal or the, the stones or things like that. And But you know, if you stick them under a microscope, you can imagine you're seeing like circuit boards and things on them. But you're not really. It's just it's just a bit of debris that someone got embedded in them for you know, whatever reason many, many years ago. Mick, do me a favor, if you don't mind, as we got about a minute to go here. Sure. Tell everybody where they can find more information on your studies. Well, uh, if you want to see what I've been doing, YouTube is a good place to look. Uh, YouTube.com slash Mick West. Or uh, I'm on Twitter a lot, tweeting a lot. I'm being misunderstood a lot. <laughs> uh, 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 just at Mick West on Twitter. I'm, I'm at Mick West pretty much everywhere. And my website is metabunk.org. And if you're really interested, you could read my book, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, new edition just released, which has a chapter on UFOs, but it is not that much about UFOs. It's more about uh, uh, conspiracy theories uh, other than UFOs. But yeah, that's where I'm at. Very much appreciate you coming on the show and giving your side of the story, Mick. And uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time for our audience right around North America and the world. Thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I had a great time here. Yeah, we're going to do it again. I can tell you that. We're going to do it again. Mick West, everybody. Coming up next on the Mighty SOR as we enter our number three, we got Steve Stockton from Among the Missing joining us for another spooky story. Then our main man, Javier, from Cryptid 559 is going to join us for the cryptid report we got a jam-packed hour number three coming up right after this stay tuned lots of show left hey everyone guess what we do not have ugly swag we have spaced out radio gear that you're going to want to wear why because no one wants to wear ugly clothing so head on over to spacedoutradio.com and go shopping today you'll be glad you did and it's a great way to support our show. Once you get your gear, send us a picture of you rocking out in your SOR swag. Spacedoutradio.com. Shop there today and make yourself look good. If you love your woo, it's time to make a commitment to the third annual SOR Fan Party. This time, we're heading to Reno, Nevada and the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Tickets are $60 or $100 for VIP. With that, you get a free radio show. You get to hang out with celebrity guests from Spaced Out Radio, including our team, who are coming to hang out with you. You get to meet the entire team, like Science Bob, Merle, Melinda Leslie, Geraldina Roscoe, and more. It's a weekend packed with adventure, and we want you there. After all, we're doing this for you. Find out more and get your tickets at info at spacedoutradio.com and book your hotels today at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort in Reno, Nevada. Come join us for the SOR Fan Party, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us, will you, at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Machair. Machair is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. 
Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. It's time once again to head to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing with another weird story for you. Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Spaced Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. Hello, my wandering wanderers. Steve Stockton here with you, ATM on SOR. Tonight, we bring you the tale of the Pukwudgie. The Pukwudgie is a mythical creature from the folklore of the Wampanoag Native American tribe of Massachusetts. The legend of the Pukwudgie has been passed down through generations of Native Americans and has become a popular subject in modern folklore. The Pukwudgie is described as a small humanoid creature standing roughly two to three feet tall. It has great skin and large ears, and its features are said to be somewhat human-like. It is known for its mischievous and often malevolent nature, often causing trouble for humans who cross its path. According to legend, he has the ability to shapeshift, disappear, and reappear at will, and also produce fire. It's also believed to have a strong connection to the natural world, often using plants and animals to aid in its mischief. In Wampanoag folklore, the Pukwudgie is both feared and respected. It's said to be a powerful and intelligent creature within knowledge of the natural world. It's also believed to be a guardian of the forest, protecting the land and its inhabitants from harm. Despite its revered status, encounters with the Pukwudgies are said to be dangerous. The creature is known for its trickery and has been known to lead humans astray in the forest, causing them to become lost and or disoriented also been known to throw rocks or use other means to cause physical harm. In modern times, the Pukwudgie has become a popular subject in paranormal and cryptozoological circles. Many people claim to have encountered the creature or have seen evidence of its existence, including strange footprints or unexplained phenomena in the forest. While the existence of the Pukwudgie remains a matter of debate, the legend continues to captivate and intrigue people around the world. Its mischievous and unpredictable nature, as well as its connection to the natural world, make a fascinating subject of study for those interested in folklore, mythology, and the paranormal. Well, wondering wonders, there you have it. What do you think of the mysterious Pukwaji? I look forward to your comments. Thanks again for listening to ATM on SOR. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll see you a little further on down the trail. Thank you, Steve. And to find more from Steve Stockton, Head over to youtube.com forward slash among the missing and check on out his great, great stories that he puts out on a daily basis. I love the channel. I love the stories. He's got a great team of writers behind him researching these great missing people stories. Well worth the entertainment. All right. From the missing to the mountains of California, big bad Javier from cryptid 559 filling in for super Duke on the cryptid report tonight javier my man haven't seen you since vegas except in our chat room but hope you're doing well i hope you had a good time at our fan party my man Oh, yeah, I definitely had a good time. Can you hear me well? You are sounding beautiful. Look beautiful. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yep. Uh, thanks for inviting us. Thanks for having us on tonight. Oh, anytime, my man. Anytime. We love uh, having you here. And, and you know, thank you for filling in as we got you until the top of the hour talking okay. all things cryptid. And, you know, yesterday I got sent some pictures from a listener who lives south of me. And I'm not going to give out where he lives but I had a couple of conversations with him earlier today about the Sasquatch that are roaming around his area, plus some other high strangeness that is going on. And, and what's interesting about it is his property, he's got 10 acres and it's situated kind of in between two reservations. 
Mm-hmm. And the high strangeness coming in from both sides, from the property being haunted to finding 19 and a half inch footprints, you wow. know, I mean, I he's like, Dave, when are you coming down? <laughs> Dude, yeah. I, I'm like, I want your property. <laughs> All right. I want to live there. I want, I couldn't, I couldn't though, because there's literally no internet service there, mm. you know? Yeah, usually, you know, those areas, there's no internet service, so it's it's hard to go live, and it's, you know, like in our areas, or we have our our hotspots, you know, it's it's hard to go live because there's no internet service. Well, I hear you. I hear you. But, I mean, Javier, there we hear of these, you know, we were talking with, with Mick West earlier, and I know you were listening in, and, and we talk about these properties that people have where it's just – total high strangeness you know hauntings and cryptids and fairies and orbs and ufos and and everything that goes along are do you think that these are a lot more common than what we have found i think so i think there's uh there's a lot more areas a lot more hot spots that we know about um people out there don't want to talk you know you know it's for being ridiculed which i understand and uh, but little by little, I believe people are, are talking more now than never, you know. And with all this stuff coming out and disclosure, I believe is coming soon, and and people are starting to to uh, to come out and tell their stories or in and, uh, and reach out to to groups, you know, all these cryptid groups and paranormal groups. So uh, yeah, I feel like there's there's more areas that we know about. I, I would love to have something like that. Like when my friends had that 10 acre property, there was high strangeness all over the place. You know, knowing what I know now, I would probably set up, you know, some sort of secret scientific experimentation. You know, I yeah. know enough scientists now from being in this field where I'd be like, hey, guys, like, let's test my property. Let's set up some experiments here and and kind of get things going and i would do that now but like back then when when everything was was happening it was just so fresh and we were so in awe because literally it was every night it was every night where the ghosts were coming out or or the high strangeness in the yard would be happening you know you'd you'd you know be outside and all of a sudden you'd hear like slapping on, in one of their ponds. Well, they didn't have fish in those ponds. There was no beavers mm-hmm. in those ponds. Okay. So what is taking a stick and slapping the water? Yeah. You know, and you know, when you live in a rural area, it's not just some teenage kid playing a, a trick <laughs> on you at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? All right. Yeah, and you know, we, I've experienced that too, you know, in our areas and and one time we were out at my friends uh in the in the country, we were out there and uh I had heard that there was going to be some some uh the military is going to be doing some maneuvering and um flying over, you know, out out, out here in the country, and they were going to be doing some maneuvers and so we went out to my friend's place out in the country and uh so we can get a better area you know so we can see the night sky but unfortunately it was cloudy that night and we can hear like helicopters but we couldn't see them so i i believe they were over the you know above the clouds doing what they were doing but that night you know while we were out by the road it was all dark you know he his house is away from the road uh quite a bit and it was all dark so we were just parked out by the road and all of a sudden i hear feet like walking on the on the road (laughs) you hear the feet you know somebody walking and then so we both all three of us go quiet and and i i see across the street from us a white pants um i didn't see a, a, the upper torso but i did see black hair i couldn't see the face long black hair and white pants and then some she was carrying it was a lady of course and she was carrying something and this is like at 11 o'clock at night and she was walking i don't know where she came out of because there were citrus orchards all around this house. But we heard, you know, as, as soon as I heard the footsteps on the road, we all heard it. And they walked right in, you know, right across on the road, right across from us. And we were looking at her. 
And we couldn't see the face again. I'm telling you, I could not see the face. I could just see long black hair and white pants. And my cousin's whispering to me, hey, what the heck, dude? Does she need help? I go, dude, I got a bad vibe from this. Don't, don't ask her anything. Don't approach her, nothing. Just let her, let's let her do her thing and let her go. So she just walked across from us. And then once she passed us, she walked across the street and into the orchard. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, there's there's a lot of craziness out here. There's I don't know where she came from, Dave. That was that's what's weird. There is so much strange that people are experiencing, whether it's cryptids, UFOs, paranormal, like this great story you just shared with us. You know, for for you as an investigator, how important is the anecdotal story? I mean listening to Mick, you know, I understand his concerns and levels of frustration with it, but overall, you know, I, I like a good anecdotal story. I look at it as a good lead. Like for instance, the gentleman I was talking to you about a few minutes ago about his property, I, I would have nothing to go on if I didn't get his story. Yeah. And, and that's a place to go. Like that is a lead for me. Right. What, what, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we need to. Yeah, I, that's what we. That's why we hear, you know, other stories from other people, and we need to have those stories. You know, I need. We need to have people reach out to us, and then we'll go investigate. That's what we do. Um, yeah, we can. You know, I'm also as you know, as a group, we're also out there looking for evidence in certain areas. Uh, now I know what to look for. You know, and and I look in those areas, and if I see evidence, then. We're going to be going in there now. If it's private property, obviously we're going to have to ask permission. But if it's not, you know, if it's uh, if it's along by the road or something like that, you know, like a park or something, then we're going to go in there and park and, and go investigate those areas. But yeah, but I mean, you know, we also, you know, we try to reach out to people and and ask them if they, you know, if they live out in the country or or, or anywhere, you know, our friends or family and our families know already, you know, what we're doing. So they, when they hear from a friend of theirs, talk about some strange stuff or they encounter something, then they'll tell, "Hey, we have, <laughs> I have a, a son or I have a, a nephew that does this," and and then they'll tell their story, and then they they'll tell us, and then then that then from there we get all the information, the location, and we head out there. But yeah, I mean, it, it, we need to have people talk, you know, to reach out to us. No, uh, do you find more people? are getting more comfortable in reaching out i feel i i believe so i see it too now now um i see some family members now are are going more towards believing being more believers in my side um but yeah i, I do I, I see a lot of more people coming they're not a they're not being you know afraid of, of talking about it anymore at least around me you know that's because your family learned you're a weirdo, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, I'm, I don't shoot the messenger here, my man. You know, don't my family, my family's experienced so much stuff. It's like, <laughs> hey, I'm not weird because you've experienced stuff too. So don't, <laughs> I'm not weird. <laughs> Javier from Crypto 559 is here tonight on Space Out Radio. Javier. You know, you uh, are looking for Bigfoot. You're looking for Dogman. You're looking for a number of really cool things that are out there right now. You know, yeah. how is, uh, you know, from when we talked to you a few months ago, how has your season gone so far? You know, it's been pretty busy with work, but we did go out a couple of weeks ago back to the Avocado Lake area. And right now, unfortunately, the, the river is all closed off because of the massive uh, snow melt that we're getting down down here in the valley so it's overflowing the king's river and uh, so they they closed down all the, the avocado lake anything along the river it's all closed down but we can still park by the bridge where i had my dog man encounter so me and jesus went out there a couple weeks ago um uh, as as uh, it was getting dark we parked out there uh rivers running fast um we didn't experience anything there at the bridge so we ended up going to behind Avocado Lake on the other side of the river where there's another turnout. And uh, we parked there, and I noticed that there was some uh, dead animals there. And this is the area where I made a video. Uh, it's been a couple of years now 
of where we found three toad prints. Um, I made a video and got pictures, so it's it's on our YouTube channel. But this is the area where we found three toad prints heading down the, the, the turnout and heading towards the river. So in this area, there, there was a, it looks, I have pictures on my Facebook. We posted on our Facebook page. Um, it looks like a dead, a dead rabbit or a dead bunny, but it looks pretty big. And then also there next to it, it was a dead, but I believe it's either a coyote. I'm not too sure, but it looked like a coyote. But yeah, there's been, a, we've always noticed in that, that turnout that there's always dead animals there. And even on my YouTube uh, banner, that picture with the, it looks like a, I believe it's a goat skull. That's from that same area. So there's always dead animals there. Something's always feeding in that area, we've noticed. And I don't I don't believe it's people just dropping off dead animals. There's there's something taking it there. Are you sure it isn't people? Are you no, sure it isn't people? I don't think it's people. Honestly, I don't. Just the way that these animals are, are torn apart. Um and there's the there's a lot of grass, high grass, and and then it's not it's not real easy to go down this cliff, okay? Um, yeah, people can just dump them over, but they would they would roll down all the way down, and they're not. They're just by the road here, and and they're just like it's just just the fur. It's like there's no bones. So I don't know. I mean, to me, I don't I don't get the sense of it's people. I think it's something else doing it because we also found in that area there's a fig tree and inside this fig tree was a whole animal and you can see the ribs inside so something was feeding inside this fig tree was feeding on it so i don't know and across the across the way from this also we noticed the a-type structure across the river it was an a-type structure and and i've talked about those on my channel couple of times and on other podcasts about the a-type structures that we we see a lot in these hotspot areas what they okay, mean explain, I don't... explain to our audience what an a-type structure would would look uh, like. we've been seeing these two uh it's usually two logs you know being perched up like an a and then one going across so we call them a-type structures so it, it kind of forms like an a and in our hotspots we've been noticing those it's, it's not and it's not like it's natural because we've had them here close to town in our hotspot area here in town. We've seen it on the other way. I captured a, um, creatures or dogman in the tree. There was one there. And then there's a small one there. And then there's another one in Avocado Lake. And then we see it again over here behind Avocado Lake. I mean, is it a, I don't know what they are. I mean, it's a structure. We call it a type structure, but is it a, a doorway? Is it a, a marking? Um, is it a portal hole, a uh, door? I mean, I don't know. But yeah, we noticed yeah. that it was there. Interesting. Interesting. When you're in an area like that, so we got about three minutes to go. What's the feeling like? What What are you going through? Um, when we've when we go out there, we usually feel if something is going on, and and when it does happen, our hair starts up. You can feel the energy. In the atmosphere, it's like static energy. You can feel it; it's all heightened up. Your hair stand up on your back of your head and in your arms. I mean, this is what we felt out there. Um, your stomach starts to turn a little bit here. We get start to get headaches. Like something's going, not something's not right, and you start getting the high sense of some. You know, something's going to happen, and usually it does. For us, you know, that's what we 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 said. Once a one. Sometimes I pick it up, sometimes Jesus does, or sometimes both of us picks it up. So we're always asking each other, you know, what we're feeling when we're out there. Oh. So the energy for people who've never been in that scenario, how would you explain it? Um, it's just, it's like a static, like a static energy, like, you know, uh, you know when you're when you people I know you know had the 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 feeling when your hair stands up on your arms or behind your head you know you're you you feel like your your hair is standing up it's that type of feeling and then beyond that like your stomach starts to turn it's not you're not feeling right like your stomach's starting to hurt like you're getting nervous that kind of pain but it, but you're not you're just out there but all of a sudden you get that pain in your stomach and you get a headache or 
or you just get really, really uh, anxious, like I do. You know, I get really like some. You're just waiting for it to ha to something to happen, and it does. You know, you're just waiting and waiting, and finally it happens. But it's uh, it's different every time. Sometimes it's everything together. Sometimes it's just one thing. Like one time, me and my cousin went out there about 9:30. We were driving out there, and as soon as we crossed this bridge, we weren't even. We were still about. 10 minutes away from Avocado Lake, but there was another bridge that we crossed to get to there. As soon as we crossed this bridge, my hair, my, uh, you know, I'm driving, my hair stood up on my arms. And I didn't say a word to my cousin. After we passed the bridge, I looked to my cousin and he tells me, hey, did you feel that? <laughs> and I go, what? what? Feel what? Dude, my hair stood up on my, on my arms. <laughs> I go, yeah, me too. I didn't want to say anything until I wanted to see if you felt it. And we both felt it. And we felt it throughout that whole night that we were up there. And, and you know, we didn't experience anything when we parked out there. But we didn't stay very long because we felt like something bad was going to happen. Like, bad. I go, dude, I'm not feeling well. He goes, me neither. I don't. There's something bad out here. Something going on. And sure enough, we, we wrapped it up. You know, we, we parked for, for about maybe 10, 15 minutes. And we were like, dude. I don't know, but I've never felt it like this high. Like it was, it was just weird that that feeling, and it wasn't good. Well, let's talk about that when we return on the show here, because you know, I it's not the first time I've heard or even felt like something like that going on, where you enter an area and all of a sudden you start feeling ill or start feeling uh, no longer like you did when on your drive in. I think that is a big big push towards some of this high strangeness that goes on in these cryptid UFO haunted type areas. My name is Dave Scott. I am the captain of the blue train tonight. Javier from cryptid 559 in California is with us. Cryptid report continues on space down radio right after this. Stay tuned. All right, we're clear, dude. Good. Hello, everybody in the chat. I can't see the chat, but hello, everybody in the chat. And he wants to know where you're located. Uh, we're located in Reedley, California, which is about 30 minutes east of Fresno, California. It's in the Central Valley. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're between Bakersfield and uh, Sacramento in the middle. Right on. Appreciate you doing this tonight, man. Ain't no problem. Anytime. Anytime. I love doing it. I cannot wait to get back into uh, the chiropractor tomorrow. Yeah. I got one appointment tomorrow, too. <laughs> oh, I'm dying. Yeah, I'm back. Dying. I hear you. My back's doing this. It's in a, almost like an S. I have a knot in my shoulder right underneath my left shoulder blade that is causing my entire arm arms to be numb right down to my elbow. Mm. And um I've gone twice to the chiropractor. She could not get my neck to crack. Wow. And it is so stiff. And she brings in this big massage <laughs> hand machine and you know, and, and I'm thinking, well, that would be fun elsewhere. But I <laughs> she shoves it on my shoulder, and um, you know, it feels good. I I need like I need like 45 minutes with that thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, you know, chiropractors are always in a rush to get you out of there, so you get like a minute and a half of it. You know, and when she grinds that in there, it's like. Oh God, it hurts so good right now. My chiropractor's all into this UFO and cryptid stuff. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's always asking, "Hey, what's new? What's new? What's going on out there? How have you heard?" <laughs> he's a cool. He's a cool dude. Oh yes. Oh, let's see here. 
Let's read Twitter here. Uh, Mickulus. Hey, Dave. Caught first 10 minutes of your live show with Mick. I can't interact on phone because it's in the code of my tablet at home. If you get a chance, ask. Sorry, I didn't get a chance. Uh, the Out There channel. This is a very nice uh, tweet. Why hang with a shill radio podcast? Not good for reputations. Oh, I, I didn't know we had a bad reputation. You know, I, you know, it's funny. You get somebody like this where I've never said anything bad about them. Never said anything bad, but they got to get in that dig. Yeah. You know, they got to get in that dig and they got to get in that because, because at one point I was friends with somebody they didn't like. So now I'm a shill podcast. Last time I checked, I was a shill radio show. Get it right. Get it right. Shill radio show. You know? Yeah. Super Duke has taken the summer off for his research. He's trying to spend I, as much time in the forest as he can this summer. Yeah, I, I wish I could, you know, but I gotta work. <laughs> I gotta work. I'm busy right, right now. Yeah. Busy, busy. Stargazer. Like start Stargazer, start I gotta wait till... Uh, Guns and Roses in October to do that. You know, it's starting to get hot here. Um, it's going to be reaching 106 in a couple of days. And uh, that's when the pterodactyl sightings start. So hopefully we catch capture them on film, man. Dude, I want to, if you do, you tell me I'm bringing you right onto the show. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I need to do something. I need to go put game cams out or something. Gotta do something. Yeah, no kidding. Uh we got about forty five seconds here, dude. Mm -hmm. Thank you tonight to Kira Times Two, Louie, Deb, A A Ron, D A L M N. Michael for the amazing super chats. Very much appreciate the love and support. Thank you so, so much. And we got 10 seconds. Don't forget, if you haven't already, give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, and hit that subscribe button. Hit it. Just hit it. <laughs> Here we go. Final half hour of Space Now Radio is now underway. Good to see you with us tonight. My name is Dave Scott. I'm the host of Space Now Radio. Glad you're here. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Does anybody really use TikTok anymore? Nobody talks about TikTok anymore. I don't know. Maybe we'll get rid of it. Javier from Cryptid 559 out of Fresno, California is here we appreciate him filling on in for super duke on the cryptid report and you know what right before the break we were talking about the idea of you know people experiences that they're having the sightings they're having you know i love the fact that i could have a good story i know a lot of people out, out there don't like that but i like it how do you do you like it what's your favorite do you like it when somebody comes up to you and says javier you're not going to believe this story I got for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to hear everybody's encounter stories, you know. I want to hear how it went down. I want to hear what, what they experienced. I wanted to see I want to see if it's similar to, to our experiences or what we've encountered also out in the field. And and I want to see if there's similarities there, you know, what what 
how their encounter went down, what they saw, you know, uh, is it similar to ours and stuff like that. You know, I, I love hearing their stories. Me too. You also have stories about pterodactyls. Yes, sir. For our audience members who may not fully understand, you know, and thinking pterodactyls went, you know, bye-bye hundreds of thousands of years ago, you've actually encountered something like this. Yes, we did in 2020. I believe it was the summer of 2020. Yep. Uh, me and Jesus were out again by the bridge out by Avocado Lake and uh, this famous bridge, you know. Uh, and we had just gotten there. It was getting dark, and I had the spotlight, this big spotlight. And we were about there about five minutes, and I was messing with the, with the spotlight, you know, trying to see if I could get some eye shine out of this island in the river with all this shrubbery going, uh, tall shrubbery. And... Um, so I was just waving it back and forth, and uh, and all of a sudden I hear a screech, a, yell, a, a loud screech, right? and it sounded like a bird, but a different type of, of sound, you know, and I've never heard before. And so I keep it on the on on the where where I thought I heard it coming out of, and so sure enough, I see a bird coming out, like coming out of the shrubbery, out of that island. And I thought it was a crane, you know. There's cranes out there, so I thought it was one of those cranes. That we see out there and and i told jesus check it out there's a bird coming out of the, the shrub that's what it was because we both heard the, the loud screech so i kept the light on it and i turned my i keep my head on the swivel because that's where i saw the dog man right so I, i'm looking all i'm always having my head on the swivel looking behind me and 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 i and make sure there's nothing behind us and uh then jesus said hey that's a large bird and when he said that you know, I turned around right away and made sure I had the light on it. And sure enough, when he when I looked at it again, so it was all completely out now, uh, out of the shrubs, I saw this long, long, long beak. It was at least two feet long. I saw a bone structure protruding out of you know along its around its eye. I saw a nub, not a point, not like a long pointy one, but a little nub on the top of the head. And then I noticed that it had no feathers, no feathers at all. And then at that time, it, it opened up its wings, and it was leathery-type skin, brownish, grayish color, and just like a bat type, you know. And and it opened up its wings, and it flapped it real slow once, and it was off the ground. And then it did it again real slow, and then it was over the bridge, heading towards the, the dam. And I didn't see a tail. I didn't see the feet because uh, it had its back towards us. I didn't see the underbelly, so it had its back towards us. But I did see the, the wings, man. At least 12-foot wingspan, we figured it had. And and it just flew, like, just smooth, low to the ground, over the bridge, heading towards the dam. It didn't go high up in the sky. It was low to the ground along the river. It was flying over the river. And you can see, uh, I remember seeing scratch marks on the beak, the long beak. You can see scratch marks. Um, yeah, it was crazy. And then when it did that, me and Jesus looked at each other, and I told him, dude, what did you see? And we were asking both, you know, both of us asked each other what we saw. So I went first. I said, I saw this. I saw the, the nub on the head. I saw a large beak, no feathers, no feathers. And I told him, dude, did we see a pter pterodactyl, a pter some sort of pterodactyl? And, and he goes, yeah, dude, we saw it. <laughs> you know, that's what I was thinking. And then, and and we had heard, like I said, we had heard reports along the Kings River. But man, when we saw it, we were all excited. We were all pumped after that. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is awesome. Now, for people who don't know, how close were you to this? I want to say at least, at least fifty yards. At least. And it was that big you could describe even the scratches on its beak. Yeah, I can see the scratches. It had scratches on its beak, on the sides. On the side that was facing towards us, I can see it had scratches. Did yeah. it make eye contact with you guys? Did it see you, know, you guys? I'm pretty sure it did because it saw the light, <laughs> and I think that's why it came out of the out of the shrubbery. Because I was I was panning the light back and forth, and that's when it I think that's what made it come out. 
because they, unless it, and they, you know, they've we feel that that little island. That's why we're looking at that. We're putting the light on that little island. We think that's a portal. That little island. Okay, now did it come through a portal? I don't know, but it happened to be on that island. And and we have pictures of that island when we first started our channel. And my cousin took random pictures, like three consecutive pictures back to back. And in one of the pictures in that island, you can see faces in the shrubs, like fire, like their hair is fire. You can see faces. You can see stairs. You see little statuettes. You see some coming out of the stairs. There's a lot of stuff going on in that picture and that island. And that's why we feel it's, it could be a portal. And I've heard other people tell me that it's, it's a, they feel it's a portal also. What does a portal feel like? Well, well, maybe that's that's the that's the energy that we're feeling when we get out there. Maybe that's when it's active or when it's open. That's maybe that's what's causing the hair to rise, you know, from your arms and that static energy, that that anxiousness, uh, the you know that stomach, you feeling sick, headaches. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because, I mean, so many times, as we talked about in the last half hour, right at the end there, so many times we have heard people when they've been around these creatures, they seem to get ill or angry or down or sad or sore or, uh, you know, it's amazing how that seems to work all the time on on these creatures. What do you what do you think that is? Do you think the creature is giving off some sort of energetic um, energy to uh, or energetic? Uh, um, I'm going to use the term pheromone or something, where it's literally <laughs> saying, "Don't come around." You know, I don't want you here. I'm going to make you feel yeah. ill. I'm going to make you feel horrible. What do you think? Okay, well, let me tell you a story. So this one. This one happened near Clovis, California, just on the outskirts of Clovis, California. My other friend from up there, he took me to this area where um, they were finding goats that were missing from a from a rancher. So they found them in this eucalyptus island area, and he was he went to go show me this area. So we went out there. It was just me and him, and he was showing me around. And sure enough, there were structures out there, and. As soon as I got off the van, I had a feeling that I needed to go to the opposite side of the island. Something was telling me I need to go to the opposite side of the island. So I told my friend, you know, I'm getting a push. Like, I'm feeling like something's telling me to head over to the other side. He goes, okay, well, let's go. So we go to the other side of the island. And then across the street, this is all along the street, a, a busy street, okay? So on, on the opposite side of the, of the, of the island is uh, citrus orchards again. Citrus orchards and a reservoir. The reservoir was dry, so, you know, I was getting pulled. I don't know. Something was just telling me to go over there. I wanted to see if there was footprints in the reservoir since it was tr kind of dry and a little muddy. And if there's anything, it would leave prints. So I wanted to go see if there was some prints. So sure enough, I crossed the road, and he does too, and we're looking towards the citrus orchard. And I'm looking for prints, and, and I don't see anything. And then all of a sudden, I look up, and along the edge of the citrus orchard, I see – um, a canine type creature on all fours and it was really thin and I'm looking at it and it had an orange reddish color hair and I'm looking at it it has a big head I, I noticed it had a big head for the for its the size of its body I go maybe it's a coyote I thought it was a coyote at first okay it's a coyote so I tell my friend you see that I tell him you see are you seeing that and he, and he was a ways down from me he goes no I can't see it I go well come over here and I'm looking at it and it and it does this with its head. It lifts its head up and down like three times. And it's staring at us. Well, at me. And I'm looking at it and it's like, what the hell? It's not a coyote. It's not a coyote. It had long legs. It was really thin. And the head was big. It had a canine. You know, it looked to me like a canine. So then it, it when I looked at, you know, after it did that, I looked at my friend. I go, Do you see what it's doing? I looked at my friend, and, and by the time I looked back, this thing had turned around. And it had no tail, but it walked away all funky, like it had multi joints. And and it went into the orchard. 
And I'm telling my friend, dude, are you seeing this? Are you seeing it? I go, it's not a coyote. He goes, no, I didn't see it. I couldn't see it. I go, oh, man. So, and then we're starting to hear movement in the citrus, like it's coming closer to us. And then all of a sudden, my stomach starts to hurt. And then I'm starting to taste metal in my mouth. And I'm not feeling well. I'm starting to get a headache. And and I'm telling my friend, dude, I'm tasting metal in my mouth and my stomach's hurting. He goes, yeah, me too. I'm getting dizzy. Now, did this creature do did I, did he do did he do something? Did he shoot something towards us? Like an infant sound, you know, something like that. Uh, when it when that happened, I, I started praying. You know, in my head, I started I said a prayer for protection and me and my friend. And the pain went away. Okay, it went away for a bit. So when we started walking down the road along the citrus orchard, you can still hear like movement, but I couldn't see anything. You can still hear movement in the citrus and it's getting closer to us. And then I felt it again. I felt that metal in my mouth again. I felt that it hit like my stomach hurt again. I have a headache. And my friend said, dude, I'm not feeling well. I go, well, <laughs> me neither. So I started praying again and then it relieved, it went away. And then this thing got really close. We, we can feel that it was really close. We just couldn't see it, whatever this thing was. I don't know what it was. Um, we just got the heck out of there. And this was during the day, like at noon. And it's a busy road, cars passing by left and right. It's like, dude, I've never experienced that in my life, That, but I feel that like that thing was attacking us somehow. And uh, and I was just saying to pray for protection that would go away, the pain would go away. So something was attacking us. I don't know how, but spiritually maybe, I guess. But I can see it. It was there. I saw the, the – it was in the ghost. It was It was right there, and it walked kind of funky, like, it was it was just weird. I don't know if it was another type of dog, man. I have no idea. Wow. Well, Javier from Cryptid Five Fifty Nine here on Space Now Radio, pterodactyls, dog men, you know, chasing them on down. My friend, are, aren't you afraid of this stuff? Aren't you afraid that all of a sudden, if you get face to face with one of these dog men, that you know they're going to use you for more than just a a chewing bone? Uh, you know, that's, I know I get asked that a lot. He goes, aren't you guys scared when you go out there? You know what? I'm not thinking about that when I'm out there. I'm thinking about, I want to capture evidence. I want, I want the world to know that these creatures do exist. I want people to know that they exist. I'm not going after, you know, I'm not chasing after them. I'm just going and sitting there and these things come to us. Now, now I'm not, gonna, I'm not there to hurt them. Okay. I'm not there to hurt them. I say a protection of prayer when I when we go out there. I'm not there to hurt, you know, and and uh, I don't feel I feel like if I'm not there to hurt them, they're not you know, they're not gonna hurt me. That's the sense I get. Unless we got that like that one time me and my cousin got that bad, bad, bad feeling <laughs> from the first time we were up there. Got that bad, bad feeling. Okay, I'm not I'm not gonna stick around. That's not good. So we're no, I stick around at that point, dude. No, I stick- <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. believe that there is any correlation between what we know as dogman and what we know as werewolves? Um, yeah, I think so. These stories came from somewhere. You know, after seeing that, what I saw, you know, I, I believe vampires exist. I do. I I feel like everything exists now. Everything's, you know, these these stories come from somewhere. They have to, you know. And I heard a lot of stuff from, you know, Hollywood gets their stories. I mean, a lot of the stories are real. I mean, (laughs) I hear a lot of 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 stuff. uh, uh, People tell me that that a lot of Hollywood gets their stuff that, and it's real. Stuff is real. It's very interesting. It's yeah. very interesting because, you know, I, I I don't know why. I've just been delving on that lately about whether or not there is some sort of, of combination or correlation between Dogman and and the, the what we would know as a werewolf. You know, but on the flip side, I don't know enough people that are, you know, running out of their house screaming at midnight on a full moon night you know, uh, waiting to change shape, 
you know, except maybe, yeah. except maybe Sully Erna from Godsmack. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Either that, or they, or they cover it up. They cover it up. You know. What do you mean by cover it up? I I know in our area, um, when there's a something being called in that's either a Sasquatch sighting or a Dogman sighting, they have code words for it. We know about that here in our area, so they cover it up. So you're not going to know if you're listening on a scanner. They have these code names for them. Susie B wants to know, Are you? do you ever take anyone out in the field? I think she wants to go with you. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll take you I'll take you in the, in the area. I never go alone. None of us go alone. We never go alone to these areas, especially at night. No way. But if it's a group of us, yeah, we'll go. Make sure she wears her spaced out radio jacket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the bedazzled one. <laughs> that was awesome. That was nice. Yeah. That, that was awesome. Javier, what's your uh, best account or story that you've heard this year so far? Um the Las Vegas one. I believe that's true. That's that's awesome. I mean that game cam footage, I believe that creature the way it moves. The way it moves, and especially when it got startled, the way it moved, looking back, that right there gave me the chills. And and when I was looking at that footage, you know, it was hunched over. And people don't know, you know, the fence, usually the fence of the properties are usually about six feet high. This thing was hunched over, kneeling down, and it was already almost the size of the fence. It wasn't even standing upright. So this thing had to be tall. It had to be at least what he was saying. It was t- 10 to 8 feet tall. These creatures, yeah, I believe it. And it looked like an insectoid or a mantis to me, mantoid. I mean, that's that. I believe that was true. Mm. We got two minutes left. I, I don't know if I buy that story yet. You don't, I'm huh? Still having, I'm still having a hard uh, time. That's That's fine. That's fine. And, and the game cam footage, you can see the bone structure, which is weird. You can, you can, it's almost like an x ray. You can see it, it, the bone structure. Well, I'm not saying you're wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, in my opinion, I think these were fame seekers. You think so? I then want why, them to be real. Well, why did they go and, and hush them up? It's a modern Roswell to me. Why did they go and hush them up? Why did they disappear for a while? Yeah, they could have done that, but nah, I don't. I don't know. I think somebody came and talked to them and told them, "Hey, you need to back off a little bit." Well, I, I don't know. I don't know because the police went silent on that one as well. Well, well there you go. That's a question. That's a red mark for me. That's a red flag. What's up? You know, that's a that, that's a big red flag for me. Yeah, well, coming on this show is a red flag for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love you, man. I love you, man. <laughs> I appreciate you. Well, thanks for having us. No problem. Do me a favor. Yes, sir. Uh, we got about forty-five seconds to go here. Take your time. Tell everybody where they can get a hold of you, find you, your information, and everything. Uh, we're on YouTube. YouTube channel is Cryptid559. Um, we're also on Facebook. Um, just send me a, a, a request, a friend request, and then I'll let you in. But it's Cryptid, Roman numerals 559. So just look for my look for our logo. That's the easiest on Facebook. Look for our logo, Cryptid, and then look for the logo. And then, uh, yeah, send me a friend request, and I'll let you guys in. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Javier, thank you for filling in for Super Duke on World Bigfoot Radio's Cryptid Report. We very much appreciate it, my man. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And, of course, a big thank you to not only Javier, but our, our guest tonight, Mick West, coming on in, fielding some pretty tough questions regarding... Regarding all skepticism of UFOs, we got Mr. Ron Bubblefoot Thal rocking in the background with the little brother is watching. 
Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LDAP, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. If you love your woo, it's time to make a commitment to the third annual SOR Fan Party. This time, we're heading to Reno, Nevada and the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Tickets are $60 or $100 for VIP. With that, you get a free radio show. You get to hang out with celebrity guests from Spaced Out Radio, including our team, who are coming to hang out with you. You get to meet the entire team, like Science Bob, Merle, Melinda Leslie, Geraldina Roscoe, and more. It's a weekend packed with adventure, and we want you there. After all, we're doing this for you. Find out more and get your tickets at info at spacedoutradio.com and book your hotels today at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort in Reno, Nevada. Come join us for the SOR Fan Party, May 10th through 12th, 2024. Hey everyone, guess what? We do not have ugly swag. We have spaced out radio gear that you're going to want to wear. Why? Because no one wants to wear ugly clothing. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com and go shopping today. You'll be glad you did. And it's a great way to support our show. Once you get your gear, send us a picture of you rocking out in your SOR swag. Spacedoutradio.com. Shop there today and make yourself look good. Yes, definitely make sure you go there and make yourself look good at the Spaced Out Radio swag store, the spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop. Make sure you go get the Alien Head Rob G t-shirts that are up there and the drawers and the socks and, and anything else that you might want. Uh, hopefully you guys had a great night tonight. I want to thank any Super Chatters that may have... Uh, supported the show during this replay obviously it's not live so i can't thank you individually uh but definitely thank everybody for your support tonight uh to all our viewers and listeners across the globe uh make sure you tune your frequency we appreciate it uh that you've tuned your frequency to spaced out radio where we just do what we do best and continue to do and continue to raise the bar but what's the slogan guys we on the night See you guys next weekend. Tomorrow, Dave Scott will be live, so make sure you're right here. And, uh, yeah, hope you guys had a great Sunday, great Easter, or whatever you it is for you. Hope you had a great one. You guys, take care. <laughs>